an interview for the Voices Oral History Project. I am Vinicio Sinta and I am in South Pasadena, California to conduct an interview with Dr. Felix Gutierrez. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez, thank you so much for granting us this interview. Thank you for coming to South Pasadena all the way from Texas. Um, this is completely voluntary. If there's any question that you would like to skip or not answer, just let me know and we'll move on. The other thing is, um, if at any point you want to take a break or stop the interview, just let me know and we'll stop the camera. So, um, first, uh, I'd like to talk about your, your work with CCNMA. And the first thing is, how, how did you get, how did you join or how did you first meet them? Well, I, uh, for me, CCNMA was a dream organization that did not exist because of the lack of numbers of our people in the field when I was a college student or a high school student here in South Pasadena High School, Cal State LA, for journalism there, and then masters at Northwestern. And when I came out in 67, I couldn't find, I couldn't land a job where I could use my journalism experience. And I did work with uh, Latino alternative media, active underground media, La Raza newspaper, did press relations, media relations for a lot of pickets, marches, demonstrations, um, sit-ins, you know, protests, the things we were doing at that time, and encountered a lot of reporters, Anglo reporters. But in the two years of uh, heavy activity there, including full-time employment for the anti-poverty program in press public information, I never had a, a Latino reporter come out and cover. They were all Anglo, male, and, you know, they were covering the story because of the demonstration, the picket, the march, whatever, not the issue as much, but the action, more than that. So after a couple of years, I and trying, you know, they didn't post jobs in those days, and they didn't have the kinds of job fairs, things that we have now. It's kind of who knows who, but you'd make the rounds and let them know you were out. I didn't find anything, so I decided, well, I'll just go into education. I got more opportunity in education. So I'd gone to Stanford and worked for a year with a Chicano students when they were first admitting the group, big large group there, that Frank Sotomayor had helped push when he was a grad student, and then got a PhD in communication to teach journalism. My dream was to go back to Cal State LA and teach journalism. Uh, I didn't get an offer at Cal State LA, but I did get an offer at Northridge. My wife and I, we were starting our family. We wanted to come down and be back in, in Los Angeles. So I started teaching journalism in Northridge with zero experience in the newsroom beyond having been editor of the school paper at Cal State LA. And when it was, um, it was chosen the best paper in California when I was the editor. But when I came back, it was a different world than what I had left in 1969. It was five years later, I came back in 74. Every station had at least one Chicano reporter some had two. Uh, there was Frank Del Olmo was at the L.A. Times. Salazar had been at the L.A. Times, and I, I had known him. Uh, so I should say uh, I did do work with him, although he never covered any on-the-spot stories I had. That's what I meant. But I would send him things. He put them in the paper from time to time. Uh, but he had been killed in 1970. So I'm watching TV, and I'm saying, wow, this is great because these people are on TV and in the newspaper. I wish I would have had that kind of you know, role models when I was growing up. Um, at some points I thought, gee, I should have just stayed here a little bit longer. Maybe I could have hooked up with something. But I had made my choice to be a professor, and that's where I was. So one day I was teaching class, and after class uh, this young man comes up who I thought was a student who wanted to uh, talk to me. Um, so it was a Friday, as I recall. So I came up and he introduced himself as Frank Delomo, the LA Times, who was, an, he'd gone to Valley State, now Northridge, as an undergrad. And he told me about the group that I had heard about, but I didn't have any contact with. I didn't know any of the people involved with it. You know, I'd heard that it existed, but I didn't, I didn't know anybody. I'd been out of LA for five years. And he told me that they had, uh, formed the group two years earlier in 1972, and that they'd been meeting with the new superintendent of schools in Los Angeles, 
uh, I think his name was Johnson, but I'm not for sure, because they wanted to get some education programs going. And he told them it would be good if they could get a professor or an educator involved in what they were doing. So he came out to see me to see if I wanted to get involved. And he was very clear at the beginning. He said, you can never be a member, or you can't be a member, because this is a uh, journalist organization. You have to be a reporter, producer, editor, you know, and you're a professor, so you don't qualify. But if you'd be willing to work with us, you know, or be with us or attend our meetings, uh, we'd like to have you with us. So immediately I said, yes, this was my dream, because I had the, the feeling graduating, you know, here I have the master's from Northwestern, which is a good, very good journalism school. I'd been the editor of the paper here when it was the top paper in the state. And, you know, I had the, I knew what it felt like to be ready, willing, but unable to get a job in the media. And I didn't want to educate another you know, generation like me of kids at Northridge who would get all their journalism and do their stuff on campus and then not, you know, get a dead end when it came to get a job. So to connect them with the people who were working professionally, who knew the inside track and knew who did the hiring and how what it took and when there was an opening and or an internship or whatever would be great. So I said yes, I'd get in I'd get involved. He invited me to the for a meeting and they met in the law conference room of a attorney, uh, Herman Cias at uh, in the evenings and they had a six pack of beer and the table as I recall and I, I always say I came when it moved from being a one six pack meeting to a two six pack meeting there were probably eight ten people around the table who had met each other because they were assigned to the same stories very often from their stations so Cesar Chavez was having a march or there was something happening in East LA, they would send the Chicano reporter out there. So, and most of them were the one and only or one of very few at their stations. And they didn't want to be the only, they didn't want to be the last. They wanted, they wanted to, what they call pipeline programs to bring them in. So out of this, they had formed the organization. It was it been called the News Men's Association when it first started. And it was male dominated when I went, although there were some women involved, uh, Estela Lopez, Eunice Valle, and probably some others too. But it was a, it was a boys' night out uh, in many ways. They would talk about things that they wanted to do, some of the things they were doing. They'd finish the meeting, and then we all go to La Fonda, mariachi restaurant where the Los Camperos played, Naticanos place, and we'd watch the mariachi show. And I think some of the guys wanted to, they wanted to get the meeting done and get over to the mariachi. But there were serious, serious individuals involved. I can name names if you want me to. But Well, uh, Frank Del Olmo, Frank Cruz, Henry Alfaro, Frank Sotomayor, who was on the night, he was a night editor at the LA Times Foreign Desk. So he would come over on his lunch break uh, at 8 o'clock at night or whatever. Uh, Joe Nevarez, who'd gone to work at the LA Times in 1931, and really, you know, he'd been there. This was the, the mid 70s, and when he heard about this group, he he got involved right away. Joel Garcia from uh, um, Channel Four, then later Channel uh, Eleven. Um, Estela, I talked to, I mentioned earlier. I'm not sure he was there at the very beginning. Eunice Valle from uh, KMEX. Uh, Pete Moraga from KMEX, KNX, and did commentaries on KNXT. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some other key players. Uh, Joe Ramirez from Channel 4, who had been on the assignment desk in the 60s. And they moved him over to be a reporter. I remember in 69, the last story I did when I was here, before I went to Stanford, he came out to cover that in 1969. And I noticed, oh, they moved him from the... They put them on camera. Um, a lot of the people were uh, what they uh, they were camera. They were uh, present. They didn't. We didn't have a lot of producers, writers, um, news directors, news editors, things like that. It's what they called window dressing of the set. The uh, Civil Rights Commission. Well, can can you expand a little bit more on that last uh, comment? 
Well, there was a pressure, tremendous social and societal pressure, and then federal pressure, on broadcasting at least, to integrate. I grew up in a white media world. You know, there was the fishing columnist for the LA Times Daily News, Lupe Saldana, who was a Chicano, who my dad knew. His brother Sparky had been involved with uh, media too. And then the um, prep sports editor here at the Pastina Star News, Manny Pineda. But aside from that, that was it. Well, those were my role models. Those were the role models that we had, and they were they were good people, but there wasn't any any numbers. So the uh, tell me, where do you want me to go deeper? What? Oh well, the, this uh, well, I was. Oh, the context of the times. Uh, so sure. with the racial turmoil of the 1960s, primarily African Americans, blacks, there was the pressure because the people were saying the analysis that came out was these people are protesting because their needs, their issues, their their um, day-to-day lives are not being covered in the media. So they have to go to protest to get the, to get the word out because of their anger. So that if the media did a better job in covering these communities on a day-to-day basis, and this was true, I mean, this is, it is true. That's what, when we got covered, we, we were threatening something or pose some kind of threat, uh, then they would uh, would be less prone to have to express themselves in, in that way. So the next step was, be, well, how can you cover these issues or cover these communities or cover their day-to-day lives if you don't hire people from, from these communities? So the first push, and it was the beginning of it was when I was getting, when I was looking, was for African Americans. The Kerner Commission report, which was a federal report, uh, came out in March 1st, 1968, and had a section, of, a very large section, on media coverage. And it was supposed to be media coverage of the riots, because it was looking at the urban disorders, but they got into the media of the, of the media themselves and their own behavior, and they had recommendations on, on hiring and such. The ultimate goal was supposed to be coverage but uh, hiring was quantifiable. We hired this person, we had this, they had that. The Federal Communications Commission was fairly aggr- very aggressive by today's standards in requiring reporting. Uh, licenses were for three years for a TV station or a radio station. It had to be renewed because of the red line and some other decisions. Uh, community groups had standing. You could petition to, to not renew the station's license on the basis that you were a member, in the audience, you remember a group that did not, not get fair hiring or did not get fair treatment. And the government <laughs> required the stations to report their data, their hiring, their programming, their uh, what they were doing, public service, public affairs, the issues they were covering. So basically, you could go to the station and look at their public file, that was that, which they had to let you see, and then you could use that for the ammunition against the station that they discriminate. I, actually, in 74, I was part of a file of, against Channel 4 here, KNBC, triggered by the Chico and the Man TV show, but we also got into uh, coverage and news coverage and such. So the feds put the pressure on broadcasters, which were federally licensed. So the first reaction was from the, the TV stations and the radio in terms of hiring. And the newspapers were a little slower to come along than that. But the overall picture was to get more get people in so you could get a better picture. I think the initial was to have one, maybe two. There was not any critical mass. It was, you know, you can't say we well, discriminate. Look, we got this black guy here or this, you know, Mexican fellow over there, whatever. That that type of thing. So they didn't know each other. See, I, well, I'm trying to realize, I never had the experience, but there is the work, well, I had it at Northridge, but teaching. You're the only Mexican there, or one of a few. So, you know, who do you talk to if you want to talk about things that relate to the community you're covering or how it's being covered or just your own ambitions or whatever? Most of them were the first ones they'd ever hired of our racial group. So it was a mutual support. Group. And they'd run into each other covering these stories, 
you know, they'd be out in Delano or whatever with the farm workers, and, you know, you could file your story, and then you have to stay overnight, you know, to see what's going to happen tomorrow or whatever. So they, they got to know each other uh, in that regard. They were alone. It was a lonely only type club. So, um, so once you joined, when, when did you start attending? I could never join. No, once I oh. started hanging around with them. Yeah, attending the meetings. <laughs> yeah. When you started attending the meetings, what, uh, what did they um, ask you about? What, what was your uh, core contribution as an educator? Well, the first guy I sat next to was Joel Garcia. Who was with? Uh, I forget if he he started out at four and then he went to eleven. But I forget which one he was at that time. So he came. I felt very uncomfortable because here I'm sitting there with all these people who are doing the jobs that I wish I could have been able to get. And if I'd been able to get it, I wouldn't be the professor. I would have, you know, I would have been a, become a reporter, whatever. So I sat next to Joel, who was he was. Uh, I don't know. He had an approach to him that was. Uh, little questioning, like a good reporter. So I remember he looked at me and he says, oh, where have you worked, is the way he said it. But the way it came across, the way I felt was, oh, where have you worked? You know, kind of like, who are you to sit here and be a professor? So I said, well, I haven't worked anywhere. <laughs> I'm a professor at Northridge. And he said, okay. And he wasn't coming, but it's the way I felt. You know, I felt insecure. Because I had never, they were doing, they were living my dream that I had had at one time. And now I come in as a professor, which if you're a professor, you're supposed to be, you know, I don't want to say up the line, but you're at a different status of that. So I mainly learned from them and learned about them and what their ambitions were. They had a very limited set of programs. They did uh, scholarships, as I recall. And they had very ambitious dreams of doing conferences and meetings and organizing and things and um, impacting the media. How do we get a hold of so-and-so at this station or this newspaper and things like that. They had funding to the extent that they had it. They would get, they had money from Times, either LA Times and Times or Times Mirror. And then they had money from the Faffinger Foundation, PF, uh, which was a foundation for Times employees for uh, if they had a need, like the paying the mortgage or whatever, or if they were involved with some community effort to help the community. And Joe Nevarez, because he'd been there so long, he probably knew Faffinger, who, who died in 1935. Um, he, he remember they had that fund. So he went to the Faffinger Foundation and said, you know, I've... Uh, I'm involved with this club, and we're trying to get more people in, and they got some money for that. So they had very limited funds. The activities, they had the, the meetings. They had the, you know, we had a banquet, which was a membership banquet at La Fonda, and the uh, banquet room there, the, the first year, 74, 75. Then they started seeking funds or support beyond that. And I'm sure we got smaller, you know, grant here and there from... Uh, a TV station or whatever. Uh, and they were able to get a uh, fellow from the uh, Robert F. Kennedy Foundation, which had just done a report, Silent Voices, I think it was called, on uh, high school journalism. And they would fund somebody to work with you. Lenny Conway was their uh, program officer. If you would come out and they would you know, staff your program. So Andrea Cano was retained in 1976. They got the money in 75, as I recall, and then she started in 76 and did a lot of programs, conferences, meetings, things like that. So Andrea kind of was the first permanent staff? She, yes, she wasn't, I wouldn't say permanent because she was, there was a one year grant. So they said, we'll fund the position for one year and you know, you find and see what they can do. But it wasn't like if you do well, you get another year or another year or another year. So she was the first staff person to work on it. She was a, a student at uh, Fullerton. She was older. I don't know. She either was completing her BA or had started work on her master's while she was finishing the BA. Anyway, she was a student, and she was just high energy, high contact. High, I mean, she couldn't do 
too much. She'd go to every meeting. She'd meet people. She this and that. She was like we used to call it shuttle diplomacy, because she she'd come to the meetings and we're talking to this and I've got to do you know. So she got a lot of things, a lot of things going. We had uh, high school workshops on Saturdays. We were we did cut the deal with the LA City Schools. They let us use their TV station for the uh, uh, Saturday meetings. Chuck C. Fuentes, who's still active in media, was a high school student. His dad brought him. He, his dad was a waiter at a restaurant where some of the guys hung out, uh, the Via Tasco. So he said his son was in high school and he wanted to journalism. He brought him. Chuck still in and around media. Uh, we had uh, workshops, Saturday morning workshops at different high schools. I remember Lincoln, where I'd gone to junior high, we had some there. And then at the school board meetings. So we had a series of uh, that, and I think they had some scholarship funds for the kids when they, they got out. Uh, these, um, some of the responsibilities that usually fall on staff, like organizing events or writing grants, how, how was this done before there was uh, a staff member? I really don't know. I don't know who made the... Uh, the initially, the, the times, you know, Frank Del Olmo or Frank Sotomayor or, or Joan Nevarez would go talk to Otis Chandler, is what I heard, who was the public family owned the outfit, and uh, and said, we need money for this, or can you give me some money for that, and and would get it. Uh, um, I don't recall who approached the RFK Foundation. Frank Sotomayor was on the board of the Institute for Journalism and Education, which is now the Maynard Institute. And that group had been very, they had the summer program for minority journalists. And uh, he was on the faculty and on their board. And so that group, they were well connected in uh, journalism funding and program circles. So he may have been uh, helpful at that, at that early stage of hearing things. I mean, he knew how it worked. Uh, and then when Andrea came, she, I mean, she was a hard person to say no to, I think, so <laughs> she'd cut, I don't know, she'd, she'd string it together, you know, we'll get this from that or that from here, this, you know, and make it happen. Uh, another question I had is, um, so back then, mid-70s, mid to late-70s? No, this is 76. Okay. Okay. The second half of the 70s. There were already uh, African American uh, organizations springing up. I think. Not out here. Not in not in Southern California. No, the Black Journalists of Southern California <coughs> formed later, and formed with our help. Or at least they asked us. We met at Felipe's restaurant. I still remember Austin Scott and Tony Cox and some others. And they said, you know, they saw what we were doing. This was later. This is late 70s, early 80s maybe. You know, they saw what we were doing and they wanted to do it too. We said, well, we'll help you, you know, we'll tell you how it works and how to do it. The Asian American journalists, uh, similar thing, they started locally. They didn't replicate us, I'm not saying, you know, but they said, well, you guys got your thing going, how do we get our thing going? There were activities back east. I think Philadelphia was where the first black journalist group came together, but I don't know to what extent uh, we had any awareness of that. We may have through, uh, again, through Frank, because he was with the Institute for Journalism and Education. And we did go to a conference in 1978 that IGAE had in Washington, D.C., where we met, or at least for my case, the first time, black journalists from across the country who were doing things, some on their own and some through organizations. So that was, so 1976 was a breakthrough year for us. We had a staff person. We had a, a lot of it because you know these people—they're full-time journalists. They're reporters. They, you know, they can't tell the boss, "Hey, I'm—I'm uh, <laughs> I'm not going to cover a story today. I got to go, you know, organize this or put a proposal for that." And also, there's potential conflicts when you're a journalist. They probably could have gotten a lot of money, you know, from different organizations. But then when the story broke or something, you know, they, you know, cover our story. We help your club. So why don't you do this for us? So Andrea's term ended with the RFK in 76. She stayed on as a volunteer and continued to do, to do the, a lot of the work 
through 1977, and as far as I know, it was without funding. They may have been able to slip her a little here and there, but it was not. Uh, it was not at the level that she was getting, you know, before, and the level of activity declined so. She, but she would get around, and she still represented the group. I think she still had the title of whatever it was, program manager or something. But it just didn't, it was, the momentum had been lost. So in 1978, March 1978, we had a meeting. I remember we were at the conference room there, and, and um, it just came up. Maybe we ought to, you know, maybe that was it. You know, the flower <laughs> blossomed. It had a full bloom. It had a good activities. There were more people being hired here and there. Um, maybe we ought to just hang it up. That, that was actually on the table. That, you know, we did what we could do. It's different than when we started. They started in 72, it's six years later. Let's. So I remember Sotomayor, Frank Sotomayor said that he had knew somebody who had been the recruiter for the Gannett Company who had just moved to the Gannett Foundation in Rochester, New York. And that maybe we could, work, and that the Gannett Foundation was funding the Institute and uh, Journalism Education. And he knew the person, and maybe we could approach him. And I mentioned, I had learned that the newspaper fund, Dow Jones, was giving money for summer programs, for summer uh, workshops. And I said, well, the, for minority students, I said, well, the Dow Jones gives these funds, we can do a proposal to them. So we decided to submit two proposals. So I picked the easy one. I said, well, I'll do newspaper fund because I knew they had a program. I thought, what the hell? You know, we can't even get money from good money, you know, from a local TV station or a newspaper or whatever. What's the chance that somebody in Rochester, New York, is going to send a check to Southern California? But Frank said he would do it or he would make the approach. And he did. And he did. That was in March. In April, they had this conference in Washington, D.C. on uh, students, or I forget, they used the term non-white, I think. It was by the Institute for Journalism Education. To, it was a national conference on students, or uh, journalists, non-white journalists, with a goal of eliminating the can't find anybody qualified uh, mantra that we used to hear. And Frank got arranged for... Um, Sotomayor, Frank for, for Frank Delomo and for me to attend the uh, conference and to be on the program. Are you okay with it? Yes. So I went to Washington, D.C. I had to go late because I had a, a class to teach. And uh, all of a sudden I get in this room. I'd never been to a conference. I was totally uncomfortable there. You know, uh, reception and people with name tags and you don't know anybody. And I remember Frank Delomo said, you want to meet the the dean from Berkeley, journalism dean. And I just said, well, what would I say to him? I'd, ne I'd never worked at that level. Um, so it was a big national conference. We were on the program. And we met Jerry Sass, who was the person who had joined the Gannett Foundation. And, uh, and Frank and the two Franks had met with him individually or as a, together with him before I got there. But then I met him at the reception. And uh, that led to funding that came in September. I can go into more detail with that if you want me to. But uh, they did make a grant. And then the grant, they said, the proposal was to have some money for scholarships, some money for conferences, some money for um, you know, program, a staff assistant type of thing, kind of what Andrea Level had been doing. Henry Mendoza, who was with the Gannett paper at uh, San Bernardino, was a key person. To he didn't he wasn't in the group, but they sent him the proposal to look at because <laughs> it was out of Southern California, and he said he told me anyway he said they need more money than they're asking for, and if you're going to do something with Chicanos in journalism, he saw the names he said these are the people you should be working with, so it was his endorsement within Gannett that helped uh, and Jerry Sass's vision of what we could become. So the funding came in the. In the fall, we met with Jerry. He came out in September, I think, and met with Frank and I at, uh, out by the airport. 
and with a publisher and Henry from uh, San Bernardino. And he said, don't put the money into program. He said, don't, don't divide it up. He said, put the money into an executive director and make it that person's job to raise the money and run the programs and that, you know, basically it was going to be, you know, make it, get somebody. So I guess it's the old boy network type of thing is the best way, you know, it was, I was there and I was available. So Frank, I had just gotten tenure at Northridge. So Frank asked me would I do the honors and that was my dream job. So I said, sure. So I took a leave, partial leave from Northridge reduced my teaching load and became the executive director. And he just announced it at the meeting. I'm sure there would have, might have been other members that would have liked to have applied or been considered, but he, he did it, <laughs> so I took it. We had no office. The office was my garage, half of our garage. The other half was the laundry. And then I had a desk in the garage and we went from there. So, uh... Now, now that there was a there was a specific funding to have a permanent staff. Now. Well, it's funding is any foundation funding is it's not permanent. It's what they call soft money. So yes, you have money for this year. If you do a good job, hopefully you'll get money for next year. If you do a good job, you know. But it's not it's not like a, a line item in the corporate budget or state budget or things like that. So yes. We were in better shape than we'd ever been. But, yeah, if I didn't produce, or if the people said, well, we got Felix here to do all the work, so we don't, you know, we don't count on us to do anything else, it wouldn't, uh, it probably wouldn't have continued. It was a strong membership organization. I mean, that was the asset I had. I could call somebody at Channel 4 or Channel 2 or Channel 7 or the Times or whatever, you know, wherever, and say, we have a high school group that, You know, I'd like to have somebody come and talk to him. Can you do it? And yeah. And the, the rule I had is if you said yes, you did it. And if you had to bail out, it was your job to get your replacement. I remember one guy called. He said, I can't do it. I said, you know, it's something ridiculous. It was legitimate. I said, okay, well, I got you on the program. So, call, you know, ask so-and-so. You know, they were there in the thing, you know, because they, they could trade favors with each other and such. Um, so I had a long, a long bench. That's the best way to say it. And they were committed. I mean, you know, we were all giving up time away from family, time, you know, days off. Some people could get time on their on their job. They'd let you do that for a you know a day, but I mean you couldn't go in every <laughs> every month and say, I need a day off. We'd have these big conferences at colleges and they'd bring out a mobile unit from a TV station. You know, and they'd set up, they'd have guys that, we had one guy that was a, a artist, a courtroom artist, for, and he showed them how he'd call these trials and he had these pictures he had done of different, you know, criminals, and such like that. I mean, it was, it was a broad-based, uh, active, do a good thing, help the cause, advance more people. I remember Joe Ramirez said, he says, in a positive way, but it's, if you just literally, it would sound like, he says, you know, we're, We're training our replacements, but he was saying it in a good way. You know, I want to. You know, I want to. When I move on, I want to have other people I can, I can go to. And the kids were hungry for it. We pulled. You know, we pulled tremendous uh, audiences for these conferences. We'd have them in Ventura and uh, San Bernardino area, Orange County, Fullerton. We had a chapter in uh, San Diego chapter in Fresno, you know, that were active, that were replicating what we were doing in L.A. area. When did the chapters come along? They came in that year. I can't give you a specific date, but uh, in the, you know, in the late 70s. I remember, I was, I was executive director from 78, end of 78, when the funding came. I didn't officially start, but I had the title from like October until December of um, 80. So it was two years and a, couple, and a few months. And I remember going to, you know, chapter activities in Fresno and in 
San Diego and having conferences out in San Bernardino. The Ventura programs were going strong. We didn't have a chapter out there, but they were. And we had the Inland Empire, Orange County, Fullerton. We had Cal State Fullerton. We had a big conference there. Well, did the chapters emerge uh, from local journalists trying to... Yeah. Well, there was two ways. Yeah, part of it was... The, I mean, the reason we didn't, we had people, active members in San Bernardino, in what they call the Linen Empire, Riverside, that area. But they would, they would drive in. George Ramos was LA Times Bureau chief. He may have been the whole bureau, but anyway, he was stationed in, in San Bernardino. And they gave him a car, because San Bernardino County is, you know, tremendous. So they had, they called the Otis Mobile, <laughs> Otis Chandler. So he would pile the guys in his car, and then they would drive into L.A. Because they go to La Fonda, and a lot of them were from L.A. But San Diego, they were far enough away, they're like 120 miles away, so they, they formed as a separate chapter. Um, and the L.A. Times had a San Diego edition then. So they, uh, you know, they had a connection up here. Robert Montemayor was, uh, Ricardo Chevira, other Jesus Rangel or got active in that. So the, kind of the spirit grew. And that was our organizing. It was called the California Chicano News Media Association, but it was really an L.A. group. And then it became a statewide group. Later they had chapters in San, um, Sacramento, had a very active chapter. Rick Rodriguez was there. Um, San Francisco we never organized because they had a... And, uh, Latinos in Communication group there, which was more broadly based, not just journalists. So we had members from that area, but we didn't have a chapter. And now the president is from San Jose, from uh, Joe Rodriguez. So he was... <laughs> we weren't opposed to having them involved, but we figured they got their own group up there. The ones who want to join us can join with us. Um, so... So the chapters going, um, kind of taking a step back, but I mean, this, this covers uh, your whole time with CCMA. Uh, what was the, the attitude or the prevailing view towards the professional identity of, of journalists? The, who could be a journalist, who wasn't, and who could be a member, who could Well, CCMA replicated what was the thinking at that time in other journalism organizations. The Society of Professional Journalists, as it's called now, with Sigma Delta Chi. Uh, it was a fraternity, basically, when I joined it. Only guys could join, no girls allowed when I joined in college at Cal State LA. And you had to be in journalism. You had to be reporting, editing, producing news. Did not include public relations. Did not include public affairs people, community relations people did not include anybody in marketing, advertising, a lot of media-related types of things. If you weren't doing journalism, you couldn't be a member. You couldn't be a professor. You couldn't be a journalism student and be a member or a professor. Uh, you had to be producing, uh, writing, reporting, editing, news. And that was the way Sigma, oh, well, they opened up their membership and CCNMA, or at least NHJ is open theirs up. So, so uh, that was the, the attitude. And like California's Association of Latinos in Broadcasting, Cali, was if you were in broadcasting in any capacity, you could join that, that group. And I did go to, to some of their meetings. Uh, but CCNMA was a professional association. So either you were or you weren't. They even had a rule which I thought was too harshly enforced, but I wasn't a member. If you lost your job, they'd kick you off of the board. They'd kick you out of the group. <laughs> and you know, in, particularly in broadcasting, people change all the time. It has nothing to do with their quality. You know, we're just changing the look of the station. You know, we're, you know so you're, you know, you're out, and then you get, get picked up by another station or whatever. You know, you're not... It's one of the few careers where you get fired, and it doesn't count against you. You know, we just wanted a younger look, or we wanted to get a woman in here, or whatever. You know, these kinds of things. But they they kick people out. 
who were members and who wanted to be and were still, you know, they weren't trying to pitch stories or anything, you know. There was always a suspicion in these groups that if you let public relations people in, they would use their connections with the group to get a better play or to get coverage or to get stories about their organization covered. And I think that was a fair uh, criticism, or I don't say criticism, a fair analysis. But if you're a professional person, you know, you're not going to be influenced by that. You know, and CCNMA did get, uh, you know, they would get, we would not take, well, we would not take grants, any funds, if you weren't a, a news organization. We were approached by, uh, later, you know, after I'd left, by groups that would, would fund us. But they weren't journalism or news related. You know, we would take money from a journalism foundation. A college or university could provide space for a conference. Or, you know, fine. USC gave us space that I negotiated when I was executive director for our offices without rent, rent free. You know, we were there 30 plus years, or almost 30 years. Uh, but you had to be journalism. So, so the, for example, uh, for events, there was no corporate sponsors from outside journalism? When outside media. Outside media. I mean, you could be a TV station because they're sending their mobile unit. I mean, that's fine. But, uh, no, not that I recall. There may have, well, I, I just, not, not that I recall is the best thing. I mean, because they had, like, Fresno would have their own events and... San Diego, and they may have had some restaurant, you know, give the food. I don't know, but ours were uh, no, and I don't, and not that I recall in any any location. And actually, we had checks that we sent back, yeah, because they weren't journalism related. So, so. Uh organizations that took the initiative of trying to support you and were rebuffed or how? Well, believe we would just send the check back. It wasn't a lot. I mean, it wasn't. People were pouring money in. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, rem I remember one specifically. It was from, uh, it gets into the NEHJ thing. Uh, get, it was with the, uh, it was a brewery or a tobacco company. One of those. Was it uh, Miller? It might have been Miller, it might have been Philip Morris, it might have been, it was one of those. It, it might have been, it wasn't Coors or Budweiser, I remember that. I was still the treasurer. And it was to support NAHJ activities that CCMA was nurturing. And I just I said, no, I was a treasurer. I just said, no, we, we can't take it. So you were a treasurer after you were a director? Well, the, I was the executive director until the end of uh, 80. And Frank Newton came on board, and I decided, or maybe it would have been me. I mean, they had a great thing when I left. They declared me a lifetime member. After all, they voted me to be a lifetime member after the, after never having me able to be a member. Uh, yeah, you know, it was good. We, you know, from where we started out in my garage. Actually, our office before that had been uh, Andrea Cano's bedroom, or a bedroom in her house. That she put our stuff in. I remember she brought all these boxes to my garage. <laughs> so I'm not sure. But, you know, but then like in 80, we're, you know, we have free office space at USC. We're getting funding here and there. We got chapters all over the place. It had been a great growth period. And I was just a connector. You know, people wanted to do things. They just wanted to know how do you do it or where do you do it or, or who else is doing it. So I decided it's best if I pull back. We have a new executive director. You don't want to be a shadow. On somebody else so I didn't do um, I was not involved with the group uh, in any official capacity I was a member but uh, that year but we had this rule that no checks could be signed when I was executive director by only one person or no checks over a certain amount they had to be signed by the executive director and an officer so I'd have these checks, people we had bills we had to pay, and I had to go check, oh, no, I'm covering such and such a day, can you get out of here? Or, or you know, catch me before I go to work, I start at 8 o'clock, and you, you know, this kind of thing. Because uh, I had to get it signed by, I mean, sometimes I'd, I'd go to the newsroom of the LA Times and look to see who was there that was 
<laughs> the, who was an officer so they could sign that you know, co-sign the check that I had signed and so they could sign it too. Uh, so what uh, got some, I don't know if it was the next 81 or the year after, I forget, uh, I ran for treasurer because then Frank Newton, you know, he was, he was office was at USC, I was teaching at USC. If he had a check that had, and more money was coming in, I said if, uh, you know, then he could just come up the floor <laughs> and, you know, you get the two signatures. So, so we did that. So I became the treasurer uh, of the group and stayed active then at that level and became active after a year because uh, I wanted Frank to put his own, you know, he had plans, he had ideas and he, he could make them happen. Can you tell me about how Dr. Newton was recruited? No. Okay. In many nonprofits, and I think it's wise, you uh, the outgoing person isn't involved directly in recruiting the new person because they, you know, then they're gonna get their brother-in-law or whatever that kind of stuff. So, I can tell you the process was they had a committee. Well, first of all, I told them at the beginning of '80. This is my last year in January. I'm going to go back to being a full-time professor. I got, you know, books and things and all that stuff. And it was taking all a lot of my time, you know. But I enjoyed it, but, you know, I was raising three daughters and family, all that. They were only... So I said, you know, so I said, I'm, this is my last year. And uh, so you should think about how you're going to replace. And they didn't do anything. So... In June, I took Mendoza aside, as I recall, Henry, who was on the board then, the one from San Bernardino, and said, you know, Henry, I'm, I'm leaving in December. And they have a... So he got up at the board meeting, and he said, this guy told you he's leaving. He means it. So if we're going to get somebody, you know, get somebody new. And we had money and all that. You know, we got to start looking now. So they formed a committee to uh, conduct a search, and I wasn't part of the committee. I thought the group, the job would be a great attraction to a member or several members, because we were, we, were, we were rolling and on and on. But my recollection is we didn't get any current members to apply. Um, and they posted it, they advertised an editor and publisher in different places, and they got people who, I mean, I was in the meetings when they would go over the, because I, I was on the board, um, the applicants, and it was a mix. Some were just people who wanted to come to California, I think. I remember we got one from Ohio, who, he was a newspaper guy and all that, and Anglo guy wasn't, <laughs> he had never heard anything with Latino, but he was interested. And probably if he'd been Latino, he would have been somebody we would have looked at, but he wouldn't. So they narrowed it down. Newton had been working with some community organization, a nonprofit. He probably told you the history in greater detail. And um, we had another one who I knew, who I did know. Uh, Probably better if I don't say names. Uh, who was interviewed, but it wasn't a journalism. He was a little bit like Frank. He had a doctorate and had done community educational programs. He'd run educational programs, uh, but he didn't. You could see he didn't have the passion for this thing. And then we had another guy who was a journalist, who from the East Coast with Reuters, who came, you know it was kind of like he hadn't been involved in anything, but it looked like he wanted to. So it would have kind of been an on-the-job training type of thing for him. And he might have been okay. In the end, it became between him and, and Newton. And uh, I didn't have a vote. I was in the meeting. Uh, and it was tight, or it was pretty close. And I remember somebody turned to me and they said, well, who, who do you like? I said, well, I don't have a vote. I said, yeah, but who do you like? Or something. I said, well, if I was going to pick, I think I'd go with Newton. So then he carried. I'm not going to claim that I <laughs> got him the job, but he, uh, he, he, he got the job and came in. And he didn't have a journalism experience, but he, he knew what it took to run a nonprofit and he, you know, work with a board and raise funds.
and have a vision beyond. Because what you don't want is somebody replicating, only replicating what's already there. I mean, they can replicate what's already there, fine, but that's already there. You want somebody to say, all right, you got this, and now we can have that, and now we can move here. And that's, uh, that's what Frank, uh, part of what Frank brought. Uh, so something I want I wanted to to uh, seize on. Uh, you mentioned uh, looking at people from from other places in the country, and uh, some were non-Latino. And, and and this is something I want to ask: Were were all the members uh, Mexican American, or were there other Latino origin? As far as I recall, they were all like Mexican American uh, or Mexican. Among the founders, one of them was uh, Colombian. Um, but I wasn't there. I understood he was a founder, uh, but he wasn't. Uh, he I think he he wasn't involved when I came in 1974 when they founded in 72. It wasn't exclusive. It was you know the Chicano was a term I grew up with. It had no political meaning. It was a self identity. So, but you wouldn't use it in terms of with Anglo's. You know, we used it among ourselves. And then in the 60s, it took on an activist political movement type of uh, meaning to it. And so the, um, they formed in 72, so they meant Chicano. But I, if somebody had shown up who was Colombian or, or whatever, they, they would have been welcomed. We'd be glad to have them aboard. And, and so do, do you know if, if at that point in 72, the choice of Chicano was... Uh, no. The answer is, if it is in 72, I don't know. I wasn't here, I was getting my PhD. Okay. I was wondering if it had any connection to the, to the political use of You'd Chicago. ask Frank Sotomayor. He's a founding member. Frank Cruz might be a woman. Did you talk to Cruz? Not yet. No, okay. He was president when I was... Uh, I didn't mention him initially, but... You know, put his add his name back. He was the president when <laughs> when I first got involved. <laughs> yeah, and a long time friend now. So the, during your time, well, during this time, uh, second half of the nineteen seventies, did uh, did CCNMA have any links to uh, or any connections or interaction with other Latino or Chicano organizations, maybe in the political realm or in other? Yes, but I don't know that we ever got, I mean, there was the accountant group was getting together of Latino, Mexican accountants. My cousin was involved in the Mexican-American Bar Association, which was lawyers as they were getting involved. So there were, I mean, this is a generation. It's, it's hard to look, describe now. We grew up without role models for the most part. I was a little unique that my parents were both school teachers in the East Los Angeles schools and had been Mexican-American student activists in the 1930s. That's how they met. So, and my cousins, you know, my mother's family, they all went to college, seven of them. So, but for the most part, you know, people were out of a community where they didn't have anybody to look up to who was doing what they wanted to do, whether it was law, whether it was accounting, whether it was business, you know, whatever. And so you had these groups, and many who were hired, I'm sure, and still the case today, uh, in some fields, where they're the only one like them there, the only one in the room, the only one in the office. So they formed their own you know, groups. You were just glad to meet somebody who's a <laughs> public administrator who's in, or in the fire department or whatever who's doing like you. So they formed these these uh, Latino professional associations. CCNMA was part of that, and out here they use the term Chicano or Mexican American. In the sex sixties, I'd been a member of the uh, Association of Mexican American Educators, and my mother was too when I worked at Cal State Los Angeles. Uh, so there were the formation of these groups starts in probably the late fifties, sixties. It was a time for... It was a time, but did we get together and say, what are you doing, or how did, you know, it was less so, I think. We, knew, we were aware of each other. We'd get politics. I remember Art Torres, who was a state assemblyman, spoke to 
a group of high school students we had once at Lincoln. You know, he came in, he spoke at our conference and did his talk and and you know, that was it. But it wasn't like we'll cover you politically or you know, or can you get us state money for this. Yeah, and, and so the the last thing we, we were talking about was about this generate this moment of, of the, the creation of uh, Mexican American or Latino Latina professional organizations. Uh, and another thing I was I was wondering, talking about the name of the organization and, and the implications, did did it as a Mexican American Chicano organization? Did CCNMA have any connections or links with the activists who were trying to make changes in the media? Like, did they ever reach out to you? Uh, This is a history that needs to be told from more than one side. Um, Ruben Salazar, when he was killed in 1970, and was a journalist, was news director, had been at the LA Times, was news director at KMEX TV here, was working with a national group that I think had Ford Foundation support of activists. I don't know if it had any other journalists in it involved to for media advocacy. Because this was the era, remember I mentioned the license challenges, the petitions to deny, the different uh, non-renewals. If somebody was buying the TV stations, you could challenge them that they weren't, or unless they made promises. They had uh, agreements for the license period, they were for programming, for hiring, for scholarship support, things like this. And these were launched largely by community-based groups. We didn't have enough, in Salazar's, we didn't have enough people to have a professional association. So he was involved with a group that was looking at doing something on a national, which African Americans had done you know, in some areas, and taking actions to the um, Federal Communications Commission, having legal representation. I don't know if they would have gone that far. But anyway, they were in the force of forming. And he was running to be the president of the group. And we found this in his files when he was at USC when he, after his family gave them. And if you were voting in the election, you sent the ballot to him, Ruben Salazar. And so he was counting the ballots too. So I think it's a pretty good chance that a journalist would have been elected. And he was visible and he had spoken out and spoken up. But he gave a, a major address in San Antonio in 1969 on the way media had treated and were treating Mexican-Americans. So there was a coming together, or at least a talking together, of those groups. The Civil Rights um, and the Community Relations Division of the, of the uh, Department of Justice, Gonzalo Cano out here, were active in media-related things. Um, so they, you know, there, there were connections with each other. But he got killed, actually, at the time that the ballots were coming in, and that stopped that particular momentum in terms of his involvement. When this group got formed, it was, they were the first and only Chicanos being hired. So we were running on parallel course. We were working toward the same goals, but from different bases. One was involved with challenging, with petitioning, with confrontations in many cases things like this. Domingo Nick Reyes and Armando Rendon. Uh, Rendon up here in Northern California. Reyes out of San Antonio. They did a, a brown position paper, 69 or 70, on media issues that are related to Latinos. Well, that conference we had in, that the uh, Institute for Journalism Education had in Washington, D.C. in 1978, April, when, where I met Jerry Sass. And we talked about the funding. Nick at our, was on the panels was one of the panels to talk about. Uh, so we didn't, we weren't like, you know, we're the leader and you're the whatever, the follower or whatever. You know, it was like, you know, we're both working toward the same goals. When I was executive director, uh, Nick came out and spoke to the CCNMA, to the board. But the organization itself did not, they figured they could work more as inside than outside. Now me being a professor, I could go both ways. So I'm working at uh, Northridge, 
and I was very involved with CCNMA, and I was the petitioner, I was the individual petitioner against Channel 4 on Chico in 1974. It was me and the Chicano Coalition or some community groups. So I was the signatory to challenge that station. And one of our things was that we said they didn't have any Mexican-American anchors, which they didn't. So they got one of the guys, Joe Ramirez, uh, who was a, a member of CCNMA, to be the anchor and with the, the morning cut-ins on the Today Show when they'd go to local news, which now is they have weather and traffic, but in those days, it's just that guy reading stuff. And so he had, he complained to me. He didn't know I was involved. He said, I got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning now. They got me down there reading the thing. and <laughs> the, the, You know, to give the news, because then they would argue and they're in answering our complaint. We do have an anchor. You know, he's the only guy on the camera. Um, I don't know to what extent, I, you know, I was, I was visible more from within the organization and with the educators uh, that individual members might have been approached by, can you help us on this and can you do that? I could take positions as a professor, and I did. And sometimes they covered me on, uh, I know uh, Maria Elena Salinas once, a talk I gave, she showed up to uh, cover it. On it, you know, I knew her from CCNMA, and you know, she went on to other great things. But uh, Frank Cruz, I remember he was covering the ice game. Here's my talk I'm going to give. So I think that may have been some advantage to the association to have an executive director who wasn't going to be looking for a job in the media at some point. Um, and so when people would approach us, and sometimes they did approach, I said, well, you know, we work. We're a journalism group, so we're not, you know, we can either cover you or we could, you know, if we signed on to the, if we signed on to this, we could never cover your group because, you know, our members would have been identified with your organization. Now, I'm not, I wouldn't guarantee they are going to cover you, but once they do this, they couldn't, they could never cover you. And our letter had, you had the names of the, Member of the board members and where they worked, that was our our credential. So it was a. Um, I'm trying to think of an appropriate analogy. We're going in the same direction, but on different courses. And tactics they used, we didn't have it, couldn't take advantage of, and tactics we had, they couldn't uh, they couldn't use. Did CCNMA ever, because sometimes I, I'm aware that, for example, NAJ would send letters to newspapers or publications to maybe question a certain decisions in covering Latinos. That happened at least a few times. Did CCNMA ever get in the role of criticizing oh, yeah. the coverage? Yeah, but the way we did it was this way. Uh, when I became executive director, because we, st we were still meeting at this uh, <laughs> conference room, you know, and the group's growing. So with me and the you know, member, and I had, you know, uh, Cruz, they call them the Trio Los Panchos, Frank Cruz, Frank Delomo, Frank Sotomayor, because Frank was the, Cruz was the president, Sotomayor was the professional VP, and Delomo may have been educational VP. But anyway, they were, so... I said, you know, let's move to a... So we moved to La Fonda's conference room. I mean, the La Fonda's banquet room. And we had our meetings there. And what we did was we would invite a media big shot to address the meeting, to be there. We'd have our meeting and then they'd come and speak. So the first one I told, I asked Deloma, I said, can you get Otis Chandler, whose family owned the LA Times and was the publisher, can you get, to see if Otis will come to our, or Chandler can will come to our meeting. And he said, yeah. So we put out our newsletter, Otis Chandler, to meet with CCNMA. So, man, we filled the place. You know, and this is how we built the membership. See? So they would come, he'd come, and, you know, and he spoke, and he'd talk, and then people, you know, they, they didn't hold back. They had questions, they had criticisms, including people at the Times, people who were working for him. You know, they'd come in, and then the next time we had, a, you know, one of the heads of one of the TV stations, and, you know, so we did it that way. They they heard us. I, 
and a lot of times they were surprised what some you know and expressed the surprise of what they were hearing from their own employees you know I remember one we had the next publisher of the LA Times uh, Tom Johnson came and he had brought uh, Robert Montemayor had hired him had worked with him in Dallas and then he came out here and then he brought Montemayor or I don't know if he brought him but he got hired and he had put him in the San Diego Bureau edition it was a separate edition of the Times and so the guys are just jamming this um, the guy <laughs> right and left all the way and so finally Montemayor raised his hand and I know he called him because I think, oh, at least you know, I might get somebody something, something good about me. And Montemar laid into him heavier than anybody else. He said, when I walk out of that office at 5 o'clock or whatever, 6 o'clock, there nobody speaks Spanish. You're right on the border. I'm the only one there in the whole office. How is that? You know, I'm paraphrasing you. So, yeah, they felt the heat. Uh, it was in a mix, you know, the mariachis would come in and play. You know, so they, you know, it was it wasn't all a, a jam, you know, jamming them up session. They'd hear them. They'd have the food was very good. They'd have good Mexican food. They'd meet other people. Uh, yeah, but the message was delivered, and it continued under uh, under Newton. Um, and then it stopped because they said we were. It was uh, the way it was explained to me. Is that we we were hearing the same speech every time, <laughs> you know the white guy coming in saying we're doing all we can. Look what we've done. And you're like look at you know we've got these people here and and then us jamming there. And, it, and I guess it did get a repetitiveness to it, to it. And we had others. Kate Willie Velasquez who was the, doing the voter registration drives. Um, we had uh, we had a political candidates would come from time to time. So from that group, you know, and it was a good venue for them because here you can talk to all the Chicano reporters in town who were members, English and Spanish media both, and, uh, you know, get your message and answer questions. It wasn't a, it wasn't a meet and greet kind of thing. Just, you know, sit down, talk to us. And, so it wasn't only media people that we had. We had private meetings. I remember I met with... Uh, um, Different station news directors or man managers. They had a K and X, Greg Peterson, about things that they could do. His wife was his wife was uh, in the group, but wasn't working at the time. I wasn't in the group at that time, and uh, so we had others. Van Gordon Sauter, Cecilia Alviar set that up when he was a news director. So we didn't we didn't hold back. But uh, the group itself didn't uh, cite on any petitions to deny or things like that. Um, okay, so meetings. Well, kind kind of uh, kind of a separate topic. Um, you you mentioned some of the members when when you give, were giving me some names and you mentioned oh, the early the, members yeah early members you mentioned KMEX and so yeah uh -huh. uh, w were there members from uh, other Spanish language media like La Opinión well Chapo was involved but he worked both KMEX and La Opinión from time to time photographer and he was very active um, so when he was with KMEX he represented KMEX I what is he with uh, uh, La Opinion, he was there for La Opinion. Uh, Albert, uh, Alberto Aguilar was with radio, Spanish radio, and then later with KMEX. I think his first name is Alberto. I'd met him when, it, he was actually the guy that first told me about the group in 1973. I was living in this back house here and doing a, a case study on a Spanish language radio station, Cali, Radio Cali, and he was a student at Northridge who was working there as a field reporter to cover local events. And he told me about a group that was forming or had just formed and invited me to a meeting. So I said, oh, good. And so I, I said, I live there. So he said he'd pick me up here in front of my house. So I go out there after dinner to wait for him. He never showed up. 
And I'm, I, I go back in, and my wife has to say, well, what was the meeting? I said, well, the guy never came. And this is before the internet or, you know, cell phones and all this stuff. So when I went the next day, I asked, I said, what happened? He said, oh, they called off the meeting. I didn't know how to get a hold of you. So he was the, uh, so that would have been my first CCA to make me. But he was involved. He worked in Spanish language media exclusively, public affairs, broadcasting, TV. Pete Moraga worked in Spanish and, and English media. Later, um, uh, Lozano family, Jose Lozano got involved with the group. Um, Sergio Munoz, Sergio. Um, so yeah, there was not, uh, oh golly, I can't remember his name. Uh, I'm gonna, I better forget. Rafael Prieto, he was very active and he worked in Spanish, Spanish language media. And Eunice Valle, who I mentioned earlier. So, but the meetings were in English, the, everything was, they were part of the group, but they weren't focus of the group. And also the Spanish language media was much smaller then. It was really KMEX and La Opinion and a few others. And then later, you know, Frank Cruz, who was the president after a couple of career jumps down, was one of the founders of Telemundo with the KVEA, the station here. Uh, you, you also mentioned earlier that um, the organization was uh, predominantly male. Did that change with time? Uh... Well, there certainly were more women as the media became more uh, inclusive women. The way the hiring went, the way I saw it anyway, you could have to get data to see if I'm on target or not, is when they first went to diversity hiring, uh, some of the stations hired white women, relatively few, but some of them did. Because, I mean, there'd always been women in the media, but they'd been on the women's pages, soft sections, feature stories, society news, you know. They were in, they just couldn't move up. Um, so some of them got moved over, women, white women. When they went to minority hiring, they hired blacks first, men, predominantly. And then when out here with the Chicanos, which would be the early 70s, they went to uh, men as their first hires for the most part. And then when they went to Asians, they went to women. So. Uh, so our membership reflected the composition of who was in the the media there, and it was a boys it was a boys club. I know, I think some of the guys used it. Oh, I shouldn't joke. It was a joke, so I better not repeat it. But basically, he just claimed one meeting we've been working hard, and then uh, this is one of our banquets, and one of the members yells out, "Yeah, we've been meeting every night, haven't we?" Because I guess we wanted to get out of the house. It's <laughs> there's a CCNMA meeting. And it was uh, it was male dominated, in terms of officers and uh, and such. As more women got involved, they did get elected to office. I remember at one point the treasurer was a a woman, so when I had to get stuff signed, I'd I'd go to see her. And uh, and I think it's hard to predict what would have happened. But I think Maria Elena Salinas was on track, and she was very active as a reporter, and then uh, uh, with KMEX, with a group, mainly with the scholarships area. And I think she was on track to be the president. But uh, when the NHJ came, it was said, I don't know if it was true or not, that she got more involved with the NHJ stuff. We can get into the CCNMA and ASJ thing later. So they didn't, it wasn't a woman president for a while. Evelyn Fierro, I think, was the first woman president in the late, mid to late 80s. Um, 
Let me just say, and there were, I'm sure there were women's issues that never got raised. Because there was a lot of sexism and, you know, I mean, people were hired based on their looks and things like that, or part of, that was one of the criteria that they would look at on TV. And, and there, there were, I'm sure there were women that if they'd had a woman's caucus, other issues would have emerged that uh, should have been on the table that guys just weren't aware of. How did how did CCNMA uh, end up with an office in USC? How was that? Well, I was it had been in the bedroom or one of the bedrooms of, of um, Andrea Cano. I never saw it, so I don't. That's why I don't know. I don't know if it was in her bedroom or another room that was a bedroom. Um, and then it was in half of our garage in Monterey Park, one car garage, um, and. At the same time that all this was happening with me, with CCNMA, I'd been approached by the director of USC Journalism School about joining their faculty, which was Ed Bassett. Um, so it was like a parallel thing. You know, I was doing this and talking to them and seeing what would develop or not develop, as you'll find in higher ed. A lot of people talk about jobs as don't materialize. So, but for me, it would be a dream. It was a much closer to my house. And for one, the teaching load was uh, less demanding than at the state colleges. The pay was better, and uh, you know the school had more of a name than Northridge. Although the Northridge journalism program was first very very good when I at the years that I was there. Not just because I was there when I got there when I left, it still was. So as we got into uh, talking about things and it looked like something might materialize, I called Frank Sotomayor because I knew that the Institute for Journalism Education was based at Berkeley, at the UC Berkeley School of Journalism. So I asked Frank, I said, so what's, the, what's the deal you guys, what's, you know, how's that thing at Berkeley work? And he says, well, they gave us a space. He said, but I don't really know the, in, you know, or I shouldn't say, I'm paraphrasing it. He said, but the one to talk to is Nancy Maynard. She she knows what that, you know, how it works with them. But we have the summer program there, they give we have office space there. But so I called Nancy and who I'd known from this conference in um, in um, Washington DC in nineteen seventy eight. I'd met there. I'd met her there and she'd work with me and getting things. She was a good connector. She and her husband, Bob, were the running things and later went on to own the Oakland Tribune. And so I said, what's the deal? You know, a nice way, but kind of. She says, well, the way it works is they give us the space and we come up with the money. They don't fund, you know, they don't fund any positions. They don't fund any of our programs. They don't, you know but they give us space from which to operate. So when I went back to SC for another meeting, I told Bassett, I said, well, yeah, I get this, sounds, this is all looking good, but you know, I'm involved with this uh, Chicano News Media Association and uh, um, you know, they're, we need space. You know, they're working out of my garage and it's getting bigger. We'd gotten, we'd gotten refunded, which they never did, but we got it from the Kennedy Foundation for another staff position after a year of not, or two years of not having any, or a year and a half. And now they said they'd give us another one. We hired, uh, you know, somebody, somebody for that. And so I'm gonna need space and I had money where I could have a, like a staff assistant too. So he said, oh, well you can bring it all here. And then I said, yeah, but you know, they don't pay any money, they don't, uh, you know, Berkeley just gives them the space, and then they get the money for the. He says, oh, well, we can do that here. It's a private school, so uh, so that was the deal. <laughs> so he gave me the space, and uh, we didn't have enough for for everybody. The El Centro Chicano gave me one office space there for one of the staff positions until the journalism school moved into a new uh, a new building 
which they were going to, which they were under construction. So we did that, and then when uh, when they made the new building, it was all together. So they had my faculty office was the uh, CCNMA executive director office, and then we had an office for or a side thing to the assistant, and then another one for our other staff person. Art Felix was the staff staff person, one of the staff people. So that's how it. It happened, and then when I left, we had a new director because the guy who gave us the deal had moved on, and uh, I told him I'm going to leave CCNMA. And the journalism person said, "Okay." I said, "But that office is the journal. That's the CCNMA executive director's office. So you need to find me another faculty office. I'm still on the faculty." So they did. So we maintained that A space there until the, some, like 2010 or something like that. So maybe it wasn't, it was more like 20 years, I guess, or 2013 or so. And uh, the, I don't know, I wasn't involved later on. Basically what they did is they ran part of my salary through CC, from CCNA through USC. Because they were basically buying my time, like if I had a research grant. And then we paid them, I think, for phone usage, long distance phone or something like that. But the rest, the office, the furniture, the lighting, the heat, the, all that, we didn't get. And then later they had other deals. Where they, and I used to pay them up front. Later, CCNMA would reimburse them later. And then there was some financial problems later down the line that they said CCNMA hadn't paid. This was like 84, 85, and not paid everything they were supposed to, and that they were carrying a debt. So, needless to say, uh, USC was supportive of CCNMA. They were supportive, and then they were supportive of NHJ, because when NHJ came on, they, you know, they were. It ran out of the first office for NHJ was at the USC Journalism School. Frank Newton was was running it then, and the uh, Bryce Nelson, when he was the director of the Journalism School, moved us to a bigger space because he saw much of them. I mean, they had with Newton, they they'd grown quite a bit, so they had they put everybody in one place, and it was a bigger a bigger place that they had, which they kept for a while, and then they started cutting them back. So at this point, um, you were the executive director until the end of 1980. Right. Uh -huh. Then you continued to be involved as well, a I was, member. Yes, but only as a member in 81. And then 82, then I, I think 82, that's when I became treasurer. Or around that time, might have been 83. So these, these were, this was the transitional period, right? Where when NAJ was being. Uh, well, yeah, it was it was leading up to the transitional period would be the best way to say it. So, at, at what point did did you become uh, at what point did you become private to to this idea of creating a national organization? Well, you're jumping ahead about four steps. Okay. The the. Uh, at least of what I was privy to. In 1982, I don't know, remember when the discussions started. They we we hosted with funding from Gannett and other places foundation, a national conference of Latino, Hispanic, I forget what term they use, journalists, which uh, Frank Cruz, I mean, which Frank uh, Newton. And the leadership uh, that put or that put together, they got funding for it. So we said, let's do it. And it was in San Diego. And in my mind, at least, there, there was no national group on the horizon. From to the extent that I was involved, and he asked me, could he could he put my name on as one of the conveners or something? They had a list of people who were host committee or something like that. 
he said, but you don't need to do anything, you know, uh, in sense of, you know, you don't have to raise money or stuff like that. So I said, okay. I agreed to uh, do two pan or work on two panels, which I did do. And one of them reflected what I, what I would have envisioned as the, or what I thought was. I thought it was replicating what we had done in California, that you had a, a LA group and then you have a Fresno chapter and you have a San Diego chapter, you have this. So I saw it, it was a way of stimulating other Latino journalists in cities where there was a cr critical mass now of Latino journalists of organizing their own local groups. And actually the panel that I put, one of the panels I put together was on how to organize, the, paraphrasing the title, it was something like how to organize your own CCNMA. What did it take to put it, how do you build local support, how do you get connections with the schools, how do you recruit students, how do you get members who are competing with each other on the job, you know, after going after the same stories, how do you get them to work together? Frank Del Olmo was on the panel. I don't remember who else was. And we got a very good turnout there because there was an enthusiasm for what we were doing and what, uh, uh, you know, what could be done elsewhere. As he put that together, or as I was putting that together, Frank asked me, and I'm sure he asked others, for names of other Latino journalists. That's how Maggie got involved. I said, well, there's this woman that been in Boston and now she's in Dallas on WFAA TV. Maggie Rivas, uh, you know, you might want to cut there. Um, Norma Sosa. So I, and I'm sure I gave them other, other names that don't stand out right now. So he identified different people in different regions to be part of the, com either organizing it or to be at the conference to invite them to come. So I thought what would come out of it would be uh, a lot of seedlings, kind of like a Johnny Appleseed type of thing where we'd spread the seeds and you'd see something sprout up. And there, there, had, there was a group in Houston for a number of years that had been active, we'd been in touch with. And, and there were places where barely didn't have a formal association, but the people would get together from, or at least knew each other and talk about things. So that was our, that's what I thought would come out of it. But as you know, or as you'll find out, when groups get together, uh, they take a life of their own. So I saw this as a one-shot deal. We'll do a na you know, national conference and then I'll have these other things. And if they ever did get linked, they'd be links on a chain, but they'd be based. But there was an enthusiasm for forming a national group that either came out immediately thereafter or shortly after that conference. I think some of it was Frank and the group he was working with because he'd brought a, a wider circle. Certainly some of it would have been uh, with the encouragement of Jerry Sass and the Gannett Foundation. And some of it was people who wanted to be, you know, part of something bigger. There certainly were members of CCNMA who were very CCNMA based local, you know, organized local, and then there were others who said, no, let's, let's go national. We've got a good thing. Let's take it national. So, do you want to continue or do you want to go? Oh, well, yes, um, about the conference itself. Um, so, it's, it, it sounds like it was a very momentous event. It brought people together. It brought people together who didn't know each other. And didn't, in many cases, didn't really know each other's groups because they had Cubans, you had Puerto Ricans, <laughs> you had Chicanos, you had Californian Chicanos, you had Texas Chicanos, you had, you know. So it was, it wasn't, well, I say a competition, but you know, you just got to get to know each other because your name's Rodriguez doesn't mean you, you know, all know each other. Secondly, they had people that had had common experiences in many cases of being the first, the only, or early uh, Latino in their, in their newsroom. They even talked about, they all got covered, there was like a litany of stories, you know, you'd get covered the community events, Cinco de Mayo, or, you know, Puerto Rican independent, that kind of stuff. 
you know, that they, these kinds of things that they all, there was a mentality that they were out there to get that they had to fit into. And there were just people glad to meet people like them who, you know, who they didn't know and who were doing similar things in New Mexico or Colorado or whatever. So yeah, there was a, a form of, it was still, I think at that point, I'm not a sociologist, I think there was still a stronger group identity than overall identity. You know, Puerto Rican first or Chicano first, but these people are kind of like me, so let me get to know them. But there wasn't an animosity or anything, or we're better, or we're, you know, hear my story and then you'll understand everything. It was more like, let's see what we can do together. And there were a few people like Charlie Erickson who were really truly working at a national level. Because with the Hispanic link, he was, you know, he was covering all of it. So he had, he had a, and he was in D.C., which was, draws people. So he had, you know, he had a perspective that, of the different groups. Not coming up this way, he was California based, but he'd, he'd been in D.C. for a while then. <clears throat> so, uh, during or after the 1982 conference, did you become interested in being a part of the of this new organization, or how no. did you see it? Uh, personally, I saw it as a journalist organization. I thought it should be organized and run by journalists, not journalism professors. Secondly, there was a critical mass. I mean, there really, when they approached me to CCNMA, there was a show where, you know, <laughs> I'm the only guy here. If I go to work for CCNMA, there's not going to be any Mexican here at the station or whatever. That kind of, almost a little overstatement, but kind of like that. But now there was a lot of people out there. And we had a professional staff. And I, you know, my attitude is you do what you can do while you're there to do it. And then you move you know, on whatever else you're going to do and other people are there to do things. So we had a, we had a job fair, the way I recall it, and it may be you have to verify. The, uh, the national conference happened in San Diego in autumn or late winter or, or late fall or something like that. And we had an annual job fair that I didn't mention that I had started here with Frank Sotomayor the Journalism Opportunities Conference at USC. That was in, in those years was in January. Or, um, that uh, was a big, we'd get people from El Paso, Tucson, where they'd come here. It was, it was the second largest minority job fair in the country. That CCNMA had started with the black journalists and Asian before they even had organizations. We included them at the beginning. It was sponsored by CCNMA. But from the very first, Clint Wilson, African American a professor, had worked with me on it, and we got it to go. Nancy Contreras, who really organized, who was the other staff person at CCNMA, on the Robert F. Kennedy Fellow, the second one. Um, so that was a big event, and the Gannett Foundation um, staffer, I, I think he, he was director of education, and Jerry Sass would come out for that. So we had a dinner at this French restaurant, as I recall, T-A-I-X restaurant, after the conference was over. And there was, there was the Chicano, but it was, and it was kind of a look back at the, what had happened in San Diego and what to go forward. And there was talk about doing something national, but it was just talk, as far as I know. Again, Newton or others can tell you better. So Jerry gets up to speak, because we're thanking him for supporting this, supporting that, and all that. And it was, I don't think it was raised by him, but it had been raised the possibility of going national. And some members or other people had spoken, either at that dinner or prior, that, you know, no, this, we're not going to do that. You know, that's somebody else, whatever. So he got up and he said that the Gannett Foundation was prepared to help the formation of a national association. I don't know if he used the title, but National Association of Hispanic Journalists. And then, because he was getting this kickback, 
And he said, and if CCNMA is not willing to do this, we'll find somebody who is. Punto. He's not a man of a few words. But it says, you know, we see great potential for a group. And he used to always tell us, he'd come to our meetings when he'd make the grants and other, and he'd say, you know, you're only limited by your own ambition. This group can be as great and as big as it wants to be, CCNMA. But you're only limited to your ambition. So he was raising the ante to us. And then he raised it for me, too, because, you know, I'm saying, well, you know, we got a good L.A. thing going, and they can do a thing in Chicago or whatever. So he came, and he... He just laid it down. He said, you know, we're, we're going to, we think there should be a national association and you guys can do it. We got, you know, basically we have a record with you. You've got a good record or we'll find somebody else who will. So then the next Monday, that was like on a Saturday. <laughs> the next Monday we had a meeting in Frank Newton's office of a organizing or whatever, proposal writing committee, I guess would be the way to say it. I remember Charlie was there and others. And we said, let's get together. You know, we got to get a proposal. Because we hadn't written anything. It had all been talk. He said, let's write up, let's get some ideas. So they kicked ideas around. And Newton said he would do the proposal. And then I said, I'll be seeing Jerry this weekend in Lake Tahoe. I was on a scholarship committee. They had a scholarship program. And... Uh, because we knew with these guys, they're gonna, they didn't mess with, you know, they're going to do something. They're, you don't come back in six months and say, let's, uh, let's go with this. So I said, I'm going to see Jerry this weekend. I'm at their scholarship committee's meeting in Lake Tahoe or Reno, I forget which. And, uh, you know, we have the if you have the proposal, Frank, I'll take it up to him. So he, he did. And he, he could put it all together. And he got it done. I forget what the time frame was, but it was within the week. And then I was going to fly up to Reno. This is before faxes and email and all that stuff. So I said, I'll pick up the uh, proposal, put it in my box at USC, and I'll pick it up And then I'll, you know, on the way to the airport. Well, the day I was going, it was raining cats and dogs in the morning to get to the airport. So I, I didn't have time to go by the office to pick it up. So uh, so I called Frank when I got to the airport, I think. And I said, uh, Frank, I couldn't go by and get it. So what's in the proposal? He said, well, let me tell you. I said, OK, well, let me take some notes. So I put out a piece of scratch paper, and I hand wrote what the proposal covered. And then when I met with Jerry, when I got to up to the meeting, I said, I have something from CCNMA we can, about the national thing. If you have time to talk about it, we can, uh, I can tell you what they have in mind. And right away he said, yeah, I want to see that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we set up a time to meet, so I want to see that. I pull out this thing out of my pocket, uh, you know, scratch paper, <laughs> handwritten notes and stuff. <laughs> And said, well, here's what it is. I, said, I didn't have time to go by the office to pick up the formal copy, but here's what they're thinking about. So we went over it, and Jerry says, well, it, it sounds pretty good, but if they have something typed up, uh, that's what I want to see. So I said, well, I said, Frank will send it to you, and he did. And that was my role. And then the grant was made shortly thereafter, I may be getting my times mixed up, but for, Jerry did come out. We made the proposal, and he made the grant. And then he asked me on the way out, as I was leaving the meeting, he said, are you ready for another one? Are you, are you ready? Because you know, he'd seen, because I'd worked with CCNMA when it took off. And I just said, no. I said, this is, this is somebody else's opportunity. This, is, uh, this, this organization belongs to journalists. So I wasn't against it, I wouldn't, you know, or anything. I just, you know, let them run and see what they can do. And they did. The grant came to CCNMA for the purposes of organize or bringing together an organization or of Hispanic journalists nationally. It spelled out very. I thought the committee and Frank had done a very good job. 
spelling out specific things that they would do or needed to do. Local chapters was one of them that they didn't do. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a plan, but not an architectural plan. It didn't have like all the deep, like it didn't have where the windows would be. It would be, you know, convene people or, you know, advance this, that kind of stuff. And I stayed focused pretty much on CCNMA. There was tremendous tension within the organization because CCNMA was going great guns. And then you had members and you had staff who were being devoted to this national effort, which didn't exist yet. You know, it was still in formation. And I, don't, I, mean, I can't even envision what it would take to you know, connect with Miami and New York and <laughs> that, going on and on and, you know, and people emerge and you don't know where they, you know, they're just talkers or they're doers, you know, that kind of stuff. They didn't have any track. With CCNMA, you had a track record of people because they'd run a local chapter or whatever. But these people would, would come out and you didn't know them, you didn't see them. So Frank, uh, Frank had a lot of work. And at a certain point, we had to sit down with Frank or with, I forget, the people that were running with the CCNMA, the NEHJ thing with CCNMA, because it was taking so much of our time, we felt that it was eroding our programs. And we sat down, we had lunch over by the LA Times, and we said, look, you know, you can't, you basically you can't carry two briefcases forever. We didn't use that term, but that would be the analogy. And so we need to, uh, you know, we need to, either separate or either we become NEHJ, which could have happened, or spin off NEHJ, which did happen, or NEHJ just, you know, we provide the first organization stuff and then you decide how you want to do it. But I remember we did say at the end, we will carry Frank on our payroll while for this year while he works on NEHJ. And that surprised the NHJ people that were working on that. Because we were, they thought we were going to pull out and say, you know, fine, do you want to make a national organization? You know, we'll administer the grant, you know, we'll handle the bookkeeping and all of that, but, you know, staff time and all that, you, you know, you've got to get your own guy to there. Or, Frank, you've got to decide, are you going to do this or are you going to do that? And we, I remember we said, we'll, we'll, carry, we'll carry him for the organizational period. Now he might tell you where the money got split and how it, but our approach was fine. If you know this is a good effort to do, this is an important thing to do, we'll just recognize. And he had a good staff. He had good people under him. You know, as long as we got these people that are still working things, you know, then you can take care of Frank's stuff out of our out of our grant. So it was on. It went on that basis. You know, we lost. In terms of loss, we lost some good potential leadership within CCNMA in terms of some members that became more involved with NEHJ. But in a sense, that way, I mean, that was a contribution. They took the experience they'd had with CCNMA and applied it to the NEHJ. I think NEHJ might have had a longer startup period if they hadn't had that experience. In reality, I don't know that CCNMA really, they didn't grow anything probably new, but I don't think they lost any momentum. Our banquets, which Frank had started, uh, were, you know, still a big event. We had a good membership base of activities and such, so. Was the it? growth, let me put it, the growth we had was in the direction of what NHJ became. What became in HJ? I was going to ask: Was there any concern? I mean, in the in the end, there wasn't that much of a, a problem, apparently. But was there any concern that there would be too much overlap or competition for resources? Or well, I don't know how much inside baseball you want, but everything I say is on the record. Uh, 
We were told by Frank, I don't know if it was, it was in this period or after it was formally incorporated, that at some point the Gannett Foundation money that CCNMA was getting would be transferred by the foundation to NAHJ. I was still on that scholarship committee, so I was doing other things. I was on a, another committee at Columbia University that the Gannett Foundation had for a media, media studies center they had there. They had an advisory committee. So at one of those meetings, either the advisory committee or the scholarship, I went to Jerry Sass and I said, Jerry, this, you know, Frank keeps telling CCNMA that we gotta, you know, we're gonna have to get other sources of funding because the CCNMA money is gonna go to NHJ. He says that, you know, because maybe he had told Frank that. I don't know. I asked Frank if it was the plan of the foundation that the NH, the money we were getting for a CCNMA would go to NHJ. And he, Jerry just said, right, he didn't even think about it. He said, no, that's not our plan. We see these as two separate organizations. So to that extent, there was some competition for resources mentality, although it turned out not to be real. The foundation had no plan to withdraw its fund. And actually, it continued funding CCNMA longer than it funded. It's out of the grant business now, but into into the year 2000, into the millennium, they were still supporting NHJ, CCNMA, and NHJ, I think, wrapped up in the, the late 90s. Uh, when I was, I was working for the foundation, although that wasn't a factor. It was just where they were cutting back. But, um, uh, let me think. You know, having been a, I later worked for the foundation and I realized that I saw that funders like to, you know, that giving something local, a national funder, giving something that has national, something that's local, you're gonna go to the national thing. Giving something that has a lot of, you know, range and reach versus it has a more focused range or reach you're going to go with the, the larger but uh, there was no immediate threat and as CCNMA did uh, broaden its uh, appeal we had you know we had fundraising like the banquet and the job fair and things like that which generated support and we had we had dues paying members and such so I don't recall. It was more the energy. What's the passion? Uh, my disappointment with what they actually did in the end was that they stayed two things. One, that they uh, did not organize the local chapters. That was in that was in the proposal. And I remember I asked Frank once. I said, "What happened to the chapters? You know, in local NHJ chapters." And he said, well, they gave us less money than we asked for, and that's the part they didn't fund. Later, when I worked for the foundation, I looked at the paperwork, and the announcement of the grant did include local chapters, but they didn't go that route. Secondly, I'm a founding member of NHJ. I was at the conference in Washington, D.C. when it was incorporated, and I joined right away. And then they kicked me out because I was a professor. <laughs> And, and not a and not a professional journalist, and I wasn't the only one. There were some other professors, so I think they would have been better served over time. And now they've gone back to these things. Now they have they even had a ed educator slot on the board, although they got rid of it this last year. If they had uh, gone to chapter base, if they'd gone to student membership, if they'd gone, if they basically adopted the Sigma Delta Chi. Society of Professional Journalist model, and uh, and had basically because what you had was, and I wasn't in the meeting, so I can only speak from a distance. You had people representing regions or areas that basically had no constituency. There were people in those regions who were members, but they didn't meet on a regular basis, and the regions were large. They didn't have activities focused on the region by requirement. I'm sure some of them did. Uh, but it wasn't required, and so you didn't, you didn't have a, a way of reaching out beyond declaring yourself the national. This, 
And I think they would have been better uh, served over the long term if they had gone more quickly to having local bases. Having cam now they have campus chapters. That's good. Now they have city chapters or regional chapters, and that's good. Now professors can be members. <laughs> that's good. That's good. But for some reason, they, they uh, skipped over that in the initial organizing. Uh, so when you said the professors were kicked out, was you mean that the, the membership was rescinded or you're involved? I paid my dues, and they said that I was uh, an associate member or something, or something like that. Non-voting is what it came down to. And the reason I joined, because they had their provisions in their incorporation papers, it said that people who joined or were founding members, I forget what the exact title was. But anyway, if you joined right away, you could be a member for the rest of your life. So one of the organizers, I think it was Henry Mendoza, but I don't, I don't remember for sure, came up to me in Washington, D.C. and said, Felix, if you join now, you can be a member for life. So whether you're a professor or not, you, know, you can you can still be in there, so sign up. So I signed up and paid my dues and everything. And then when I got back the whatever membership card or told or whatever, they just said, no, you're not a professor. You're a professor, you're not a professional, so you're, you're a non-voting member. They had some, some title to it, which was okay. You know, I didn't, like, you know, I, actually I said at the beginning, it's their group, so I didn't, I didn't try to fight for it or anything like that. Uh, and later they put me in the Hall of Fame, so it didn't count too much against me. But they were, I guess it was uh, my sense from looking from a distance, was they were a group with a name searching for an identity or defining their identity. And they tended to define it along national terms and would have been better, we would have been better served on the organization. The movement would have been better served with local bases of support and a more uh, inclusive membership of students and faculty. I mean, so many of their founders, I mean, like Maggie, they're, uh, Juan Gonzalez, they're professors now. You know, Julio Moran. I mean, I could go down the list of people who are, who are faculty now who were you know, professionals then. So should they have lost their memory? Well, they don't have to, but you know, Dino Kiecki, I mean, the former president, is a professor at uh, UTEP. I mean, there's, there, you know, there's a, we're all in the same racket. We're just working on you know, different sides of the, of the same street. Why do you think it's, it's important to, to include professors, educators? Because that's your feeder. That's your, you know, that's your, your pipeline. These were all, you know, and I should get into it just shortly, but these were all pipeline programs. The analysis coming out of the 60s was that the main thing wrong with the media that we weren't a part of it. Then the media would bounce back. We can't find anybody qualified. You guys aren't any good or you haven't done the right thing. You know, yet you have people like me with master's degrees in journalism who can't get a job. We knew there were people out there who, and you know, not just with like, Chicanos with blacks. So a lot of our stuff were pipeline programs, scholarships, internships, conferences, mentoring, you know, on these kinds of things. Well, where do you go if you're going to give scholarships? You go to students. How do you find the students? You go through faculty. If you're going to find looking for interns, where do you go to CAP? So, I mean, there's a national pipeline there of your future membership that you can nurture and grow and develop by having them not just be recipients of your programs, but participants in your organization. But you got to remember, too, there were, there was me, Ray Chavez, Juan Gonzalez. I'm sure there may have been some others, but I didn't know them who were prof college professors of journalism at that time. Ray at UTEP, one at the City College of San Francisco, San Francisco State, uh, and me at the USC. So there wasn't, because uh, and I wasn't on the, you know, and I could have been involved probably in the organizing committee. I'd been in the committee that put the pro proposal together. So, you know, I could say, well, Feely, what are you complaining about? You could have had a chance to 
you know, being on the meetings when they were putting it together. So it's just a feeling that I that I have. But I'm not pointing any fingers this way that don't come back this way. <laughs> so, um, but but you and you still were involved in CCNMA as a, as a member. Yeah, I was a member of CCNMA, so I was still a treasurer and uh, active. So, how did this uh, this uh, new national organization look from the vantage point of the local organization? Did you collaborate? Did you interact? Well, we saw it as, and I can't speak for everybody, so you'd need to, I'm sure you'll talk to different people, get different answers. We saw it as a dual membership. You'd be a member of CCNMA, and you could be a member of NHJ. And I went to the NHJ conferences every year, usually had some role on the program somewhere. And, uh, you know, I just thought, but in terms of time, I mean, who had the activities? Who had the programs? Who had the, it was CCNMA. Who was having the meetings every month? It was CCNMA. So in terms of commitment of, you know, where do I invest my activity? It was CCNMA. I met good people at NHJ, you know, and I went to Dallas, <laughs> Tucson, <laughs> you know, place San Francisco, places where they had meetings and such. Um, but it was a once a year activity. Whereas CCNMA was a, you know, regular, ongoing activity. So the, the experience for for many or most was was the one. I can't that... speak for many or most. Again, remember, I'm not in the newsroom. Um, I did work summers at the Associated Press one summer, and the Pasadena Star News the summer before that, eighty three, eighty four. But you know, my base was my base was looking for talent, was developing students, was looking for you know uh, establishing relationships with recruiters um, or somebody's going to a city and you say well look up so and so you know I know them from NHJ or CCNMA those kinds of things I wasn't looking for a, I don't know say I wasn't looking to be more than more a part of NHJ than I was I was honored they on 1995 they uh, at the El Paso conference, they uh, gave me a plaque and named me the Padrino of Latino Journalists. So, you know, it, this all gets back to my, you know, I didn't get to fulfill my dream of being a, in the newsroom reporter. So you see your role is as a professor. And so that's the role I played. And the fact that so many people were coming up in the newsroom, it wasn't like there was the vacuum that had been there when I was younger. There were good people developing and emerging, and you know, and they had a closer sense to reality, newsroom reality, than I ever would or could. So, I was watching it happen and helping where I could. So, um, you were you were still a, a member. In some... I was a member, but there was nothing. There was little you could do as a member. They didn't have chapter meetings. They didn't have, you know. Again, I've, you know, if I'd been in, I don't know, in Pueblo, Colorado, or something, that would have probably been it. Good, you know, this is it. But you know, I was here, and there was an ongoing group here, and so that's where I put my time. So, at what point did you? And I'm switching gears completely on at this point. Okay. At what point did you um, join the Freedom Forum? I was uh, joined in uh, January of 1990, and this all it goes back to Jerry Sass too. I didn't I didn't realize it at the time. He should tell better. Anyway, I'd had a I'd had a relationship with him. Since 1978, with the CCNMA executive directorship, and he he told me once before he even made the grant, I saw him at the Journalism Professors Convention (AEJ), and there was no MC in, yet in those days, uh, in Seattle in summer of um, '78, because I'd met him in Washington in April, 
And then in August, I see him at this convention. We were walking up the stairs and running. And I hadn't heard anything. We had this proposal in the Sotomayor had done since March or April, anyway. So I saw him, and I, you know, we were aggressive people. I just said, hey, when are we going to hear from you? You know, you know, what's the hell? Yeah, okay, what's going on here? We send you a proposal, and we meet with you, and we don't hear. I didn't sell this, but I said, when are we going to hear from you? And he just, he turned around, and he said, you'll hear from me shortly. And then he did this. He put his finger, he says, and as far as I'm concerned, you're the key to this. And then he kept walking down the stairs, and I kept walking up. And I remember I got to the bedroom, and I told we were in a, staying in the dorms in those days. And I went to the dorm where my family was staying. I said, Maria, I just ran into the money guy from Ganet, and he says they're going to make the grant to CCNMA, and I'm the key to it. What's he? I mean, I'm the key. I'm not even a member. So he had, uh, and then he said, go with the executive director. And he either blessed or recommended that they talk to me. And uh, Sotomayor and, and I had met with him at the airport the next month. So he made good on, on that. But then over the years, he'd appoint me to different committees and things of the foundation. So I was at SC teaching. I had applied to be the executive, to be the director of the journalism school and had all the endorsements from the committee, but they picked somebody else. I wasn't quite looking, but I, you know, you reach a certain point. I was in my mid forties. Well, do I want to stick with what I have or is something else? I got a job as a dean there in the student services, but it took me away. It took me closer to central administration, but away from journalism. And then they had some changes at the foundation, new president and such, and Jerry got promoted. So the opening there was an opening in the journalism program area. So they extended an offer to me as a vice president. So it was his, his former position? Yes. Oh. I don't want to say quite for It was the position he had held. Because when he's, he's your executive vice president, you report to him. So yeah, it's former title, but you know, you're still, he still had a role. It wasn't like I'm running off and doing this, and now you run this yourself. So I had the... Mentorship and learning, because you know, again, I mean, you've you've done, but being in foundation and giving and recommending grants and evaluating, it's it's a different uh, ballpark than receiving grants. I guess is the way to say it. So I had a lot to learn, and I had and others around there. They were so I joined there. We left. I resigned my tenure. Left USC. We lived here in South Pasadena, but in another, another our own home. And we moved to Washington, D.C. And I was there from 12 years. And during the time, the foundation changed from the Gannett Foundation to the Freedom Forum and changed from being primarily grant-making to being, or all grant-making, almost primarily grant-making, to being a, what they call a programmatic foundation where we ran conferences and had fellowships, had publications, reports centers, and I ended up running the center. They had a center in San Francisco, Oakland and then San Francisco. And I ran that from 1983, uh, 93, I'm sorry, <laughs> end of 93 till uh, they closed it in 2000. They closed all their centers, London, Buenos Aires, um, South uh, Hong Kong, in South Africa. To when they went to build a museum. And then I stayed on a year with the museum as a senior vice president, still based out here as they were just starting the, the new museum in Washington, D.C. But in the end, I knew that I'd have to, if I stayed, I'd have to go back east again. And we liked it out here. So Maria and I, well, we're here. We're in California. Yeah, I was in my late 50s. So... Uh, let's just take, they were doing the separation agreements. Let's take one of those agreements and stay out here. And then they invited me back as a trustee uh, a couple years later. So, um, what was your relationship with um, 
NEJ or CCNMA while at the Freedom Farm? Well, I was their program. I was the vice president of journalism programs, and that was one of our programs. And it was grants at that point. So they would submit. We had, and this is the way foundations were. You start out with general support, like from the job I had. It would just hire executive director, and then it's his job to do what he thinks need to be done. At the end of the year, we see what he did, and we give you more. But as the organizations mature and develop other sources of support or ongoing programs, then you become more programmatically focused. So it wasn't like, just give us money so we can operate. It was, give us money so we can do this conference or have this program or have this effort. And that's what NHJ and CCNMA did. Now I'm sure, or let me put I wouldn't be surprised if some of the support went into providing, you know, keeping the office running. But it was to make sure they had these programs. And we had the same relationship with the black journalists, the Asian American, and the Native American journalists. These were all groups that were either founded or had their initial growth with funding from the Gannett Foundation. AAJA here had been a local association. They were modeled like CCNMA. And I remember one year after the Jobs Conference, Bill Singh, who was their treasurer, came up to me and he said, we want to go national. And this was in the, right after NHJ had been funded. He said, well, you know, know where we can get money. I said, well, I don't know if they'll give you any money, but the guy who helped us with the NHJ is Jerry Sass. You might, at the Gannett Foundation, you might contact him and see if they'll help you. And they did. And I don't know what the connection was with the black journalists. Uh, the Native American, they had published, they had funded a publisher's organization because a lot of these were tribal newspapers. And they had gone and it, it operated out of Penn State or was organized at Penn State, but somewhere it kind of spun out. And when I started, they formed, out of that group, they became the National Native American Journalist Association. Mark Trahant was the first uh, president that I recall, was the first president. And we had, we had grants for that. I was at their conference where they became that. So for me, it, this was, you know, it was the kind of job you'd do if you didn't get paid. And it wasn't all, you know, we were doing society at ASNE and grants to universities and colleges. That was part of the portfolio was the diversity material. We got involved with women, International Women's Media Foundation, Judy Woodruff <coughs> worked on that, led part of that effort, which uh, we helped stimulate. So... Did, did, did the shift to, to uh, operating its own programs rather than making runs, did that change? Um, sure. The approach to Well, yeah, if you're having money here and now you're putting money there, you're going to have less money here. But it wasn't across the board. I mean, we had other, I don't want to get into names, but we had other journalism, well-established journalism organizations, not minority, that basically got an annual contribution from the Gannett Foundation. And I had the uh, privilege of sharing with some of those organizations that we would no longer be doing that. You know, so no, no, yeah, they, they were. This was a different era than today. Media foundations and media companies were run by media people, and many of them journalism people who'd come up through the newsroom, like El Newharth at the at the foundation here. I mean, these were people that come up. Now, media is a, you know, it's a subsidiary of something that Google does or Apple does or <laughs> Facebook. You know, they're in the technology business, they say, and then they have this new site over here. Or, or they're uh, entrepreneurs who start something. So you had people who had deep roots in journalism, in the newsroom, in covering the news, who then wanted to give back, or were in a position to give back to the organizations to, to help them going. But as we moved into being more programmatic, set up centers and things like this, so it gave us more of an international and regional base. We had a center in New York, we had a center, in, you know, 
Yes, but it meant that you had less money for grants. Uh, and did uh, these centers or these newer programs run by the foundation? Yeah. Uh, how much of it was? How much of it was devoted to diversity or to issues of multiculturalism and journalism? Well, it was a part of every. It was we had it set at the top. New Hearth, uh, Charles Overby, who was the president of the foundation, Jerry Sass, who was the executive vice president. I mean, diversity was in there, but we had trustees, John Quinn, uh, later John Siegenthaler, who were editors who had been forces within the industry in the 60s when this was just starting, you know, uh, Al Newharth. I mean, you know, I can remember in, in the 70s, you know, Gannett was like the, I don't know, they were like the platinum standard of diversity for people of color and women. I was reading a book on... Uh, Kay Mills' book on uh, his women in journalism. She has a whole chapter on Al Newhart and just what he, you know, what he had done to advance women off the women's page into that. So if we could come up with ideas related to diversity, like we had a program with a sports editor, AP sports editors, to get people of color, you know, in the press box as well as you know on the court and in the football field. You know, we had a very responsive leadership in that regard. So every center knew that was part of their job. Now, because I was administering what was continuing as journalism grants in San Francisco after Jerry retired and had some of the programs, it was a bigger chunk of what I did because I basically inherited some of the programs that I had been doing before. But we'd have these international conferences that Chris Wells did, he was our international VP, all over the world. And we'd always have a panel. I shouldn't say always. But my recollection is we always had a panel, or the issue came up, of different ethnic newspapers, you know, ethnic groups, minority groups within, within that country, and how they were, what they were contending with, and how they were dealing. We always had an educators session that I usually chaired, of journalism educators for that country. They were going. So it was, it was throughout. Uh, the organizations and in the, when they built the museum. So, so you stayed there until 2003, or you said, right? 2000, 2010. 2001 was my last year. Oh, president. And my last year was not at the center. I was senior vice president of the museum, working on diversity content uh, as they were just planning the museum that's now in Washington, D.C. So, the, uh, because and, and I've seen this uh, used in analysis of, of diversity and the issue of diversity in journalism, that, uh, you know, the disruption of the business model in, for newspapers in, when the internet became more, more pervasive kind of took attention away from issues of diversity or the, uh, the active involvement of publications in that. So. I would imagine this happened after your your years there, or did you see any of this? Well, two things that happened. Again, you have to go back. It, it was clear if anybody would looked at where things were going in the late seventies, and certainly by the end of the eighties, there were two major forces in this country that were happening that would have a profound effect on journalism. One, they grasped very easily and early and understood. And even though they didn't always operate it well, they knew they had to do something with it. And that was the technology issue. They knew technology was going to change. You wouldn't have typewriters. You wouldn't have, you know, metal type. You wouldn't have the on and on and on and on and on. I remember when I did, I worked the summer of 1980, I'm pointing to Pasadena, <laughs> so at the Pasadena Star News. And that was the first daily newspaper in the country to go to pagination, where the paper was never you know, laid out in anything until it was going to be printed. It wasn't pasted up. It wasn't type, you know, everything, headlines, pictures, all that. It was a big deal. Well, they knew they had to do that, okay? And they did, and they have, and journalism education has. You don't find typewriters in journalism schools anymore. Well, the other, this is technology. The one they haven't grasped, 
or didn't grasp and still haven't had a good handle on, is the demography. The demography of the country has changed dramatically, racially, and gender, and sexual orientation. Basically, the groups that have been either marginalized or misrepresented have become more vocal with their self-identity and their self-expression. So, the, on the demography side, the initial reaction of the newspapers was as the demography of their cities changed, they could either change their news product so it reflected the people who were there, which here in LA would be more attention to Asians, to Latinos, to African Americans, such, and even some communities, Armenians and people from India and all and all. They could have changed that, or they could take their existing editorial product and take it to where their readers were going. So there was this move to suburbia to get the suburban location. It was hard to subscribe to the LA Times. I understand if you lived in the center of town. They didn't put newsstands up. They didn't think on a whole lot of things. And they're starting an Orange County edition. They're starting a San Diego edition. They had an Inland Empire. I heard it at one point they were talking about a desert edition because people were moving to Palm Springs. I don't know if they did it or not. So the media ran away from the demography problem and embraced the demography opportunity, let me put it this way, and embraced the technology. Well, what happened over time was these began merging in that people here on the demography side who didn't have expression here found through the new technologies the Facebooks and before that MySpaces and you know Instagrams and all that and all these things we have now that by the time you record this will probably be out of date but uh, where they could have their own self-expression without going through the traditional media. On the traditional media side what they missed and then tried to grasp onto was the growth of ethnic media. At one point the LA Times bought La Opinion at one time, Gannett owned El Diario La Prensa, uh, but they couldn't. They couldn't. They didn't know how to run that kind of newspaper. I guess is the best way to to say it. Uh, Telemundo is now owned by NBC. So they bought in. They basically created the vacuum that exists. If they had gone more aggressively. In 79, I wrote an article with Clint Wilson, co-author for the Columbia Journalism Review called The Demographic Dilemma. And it was, that was they titled it. We didn't call it that. And it was how the LA Times was avoiding racial diversity in LA by exporting their product to what they considered the more affluent market. They should have been putting that money into a Spanish language TV station or a Spanish this or that, you know, that they tried to regain later. So that's what's happened. So. Uh, to get back to the core of your question is they have gone there's less emphasis on diversity programs in terms of pipeline programs partly because they feel well, we're filling the need by the things that exist now we don't need to do any more and secondly I think and I'd probably be challenged on this and I might be correctly to be challenged there's more opportunities for people of color to go more places. You know, I dreamed of, I got out of Northwestern, had my master's in 1967, 50 years ago this June. I couldn't get a job in the media. I couldn't do media. You know, I couldn't, you get a job in a paper, you don't, can't do journalism. Fortunately, they were just starting this underground paper, so I did some photos for that. But now, if I didn't get a job, fine, I could set up my own website, or probably already have. If I was a student, I could be producing my own videos, I could be doing podcasts, I mean, you know, I got all these places to go. Plus, you have all these targeted media that people are going after. And you also have what used to be PR, which used to be try to influence the general audience media to cover you. They're creating their own magazines, their own websites, their own content, you know, on and on. So they're just more places where you can take your degree, and that pulls away from people. 
And I think people don't see newspapers as a growth area. Whereas the for my era, it would have been, you get a job like Frank Sotomayor. You get a good job with you get a job with a good newspaper. You do your job well, and you can stay there for your career. They'll move you up. They'll move you down. You'll do things like this, but you'll always have a good a good job. Uh, and that doesn't, you know, these. I mean, I have kids that are my students five years ago that have had three jobs, you know, and they're all in media and they're all doing things. So there's just more competition for the people there and more options for the people who are looking. In the late 90s, we had this, what they call diversity burnout, which came out, or diversity fatigue or something, that uh, Steve Montiel, I think he's the one who coined it. Uh, and that was, we were, we advocates were tired of telling the same arguments to the same people. <laughs> And the people on the other side, they were sorry, tired of hearing it and pointing to what they had done and us saying, yeah, that's not enough. Yeah, that's a good start, but you know, what else are you going to do now? But I think we've gotten, we've gotten past that period. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm not... Yeah, no, I, I was trying to get a... A sense of how, how, how that changed, you know, from the 70s and all the... The 70s was a supply and demand, 60, 70, supply-demand equation. They, they claimed there was demand for journalists of color, but that the supply didn't meet it. So we went to the pipeline programs. We went to the scholarships, we go to the internships. Well, I used to ask it, this time I can't find any qualified. And I, an editor, you know, I'd had this conversation many times. So I said, well, what are your qualifications? So they tell me what they were. And I said, well, where did you post them? Uh, well, uh, we call, well, uh, what's the deadline for applying? Uh, you know, basically they would call their buddy at the journalism school and say, you got anybody I should look at? It was a lot of, you know, that was there. That's why we went to the job fairs. All right, post your jobs. Post the qualifications. Post what you're looking for. We'll, we'll find. I mean, the first Gannett was the guy, a Phil Curry. He asked me actually in '78 at that same Seattle conference. He was from Rock. He says, "If I came out to California, do you think you could have some Chicanos I could interview who would qualify to work for Gannett Papers?" I said, "If you come to California, I'll have Chicanos you can interview, and blacks, and Asians, anybody else." But they thought the supply wasn't there. And the supply was was not there in terms of people knowing about it or hearing about it. You know, we didn't know. So as they got the word out, then it came up that way. And we had all these dedicated Chips Quinn, which is still going, a program we started at the Freedom Forum, um, internship program. So... They were still going, but the mentality changed. There was the supply and the supply now, I think, outstrips the demand in terms of newspapers. But the supply has other places to go. So, in a sense, would you say that reduces the pressure on 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 the the media companies to? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's the way, the right way to put it, but. Uh, I uh, I think there's less uh, yes there's less pressure first of all you don't have let's go back to ground zero you, you don't have the federal pressure you once had on broadcasters stations are not licensed for three years now and they can lose it the Federal Communications Commission is focusing now on network net neutrality and privacy of information all this stuff. They're not reviewing licenses every three years and where you can petition just because you don't like the programming that you have standing to file something in the federal uh, federal bureaucracy. Secondly, the commercial pressures, at least in terms of Latinos, I think has gone more to the Latino media. So, well, they got their media, they got their TV stations, they got their, they got their radio, you know, so they can, they can go there. And plus we own some of those, you know, some of these are owned by multimedia concerns. So from that standpoint, uh, there's less pressure. 
you know, it was 50 years ago this spring, might have been this month, April, that the Atlantic Magazine ran a major article called The Minority Nobody Knows. The Atlantic Magazine, March or April 1967. I was just getting out of journalism school. And what they meant was, and it was about Mexican Americans. And I didn't know that the minority nobody knows meant that nobody knew about us, or those of us who knew about us were nobodies. So I'm not sure what their meaning was. But it was about that there's this, you know, all the emphasis has been on blacks, and there's this racial group or ethnic group here that has all this, 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 okay? Fifty years later, I think you could still write an article with that same headline. We're the people that were here. They know we exist, at least, you know, 50 years ago they probably didn't know we existed much. But they don't really know us, you know. They want to build this wall. They want to round up people and send them, you know, people are just doing their job. You know, and got in under the way you could get in. You know, it's, what can you say? And none of them tied to any terrorism, which is the rationale for a lot of this. So no, they don't. They don't know us. Yeah, you know, they love their gardener. They love their maid. They love to go to a restaurant and pay less prices because of the thing. But then they hate the label of the people that these people are put under. Now that we're talking about contemporary, more contemporary issues, that, that kind of segues nicely into the wrap-up questions. Okay. Uh, do you think? I mean, we've, we've already spoken about the situation of the industry and and. Uh, Latinos trying to get into media, Latinos and Latinas. Do you think the coverage of Latinos, the images, um, the, the, the practices used in covering Latinos and Latinas has improved? It's improved to where it should have been 50 years ago. It hasn't improved to where it is today. The coverage of Latinos, as far as I can see, and you're going to be a professor, and I hope you can prove me wrong through your own research, Really, I do. But in my mind, it falls into three categories. The first category is celebrities. If you're a singer, you're an athlete, politician, entertainer, you get covered, and you're Latino, you get covered. because You get covered because of who, who you are. And we didn't have that. The CCNA founding members, they were celebrities because they were on TV. We didn't, this was before Fernando and, you know, the sports stars and, movie stars and Selena and all, you know, none of that existed yet. So they were the ones that we saw in the media. And I remember we'd, when you go to La Fonda after the meetings to go just hear the mariachis, they'd be, we have Frank Cruz here, we have Henry Alfaro, we have Joe Ramirez, we have, you know, they'd introduce us from the stage, not me, but because they were on TV. And then people come up and want their autographs because they were journalists. They were just reporting, they weren't even anchors yet. So they get covered because of their celebrity. And the fact that they're Latino may be a factor in the story, but it may not. The head of the Democratic National Committee is a Latino now, okay? The secretary of this. They get covered in that role. The second one is zoo stories. They love us when we're on display. So if it's Cinco de Mayo, if it's the Calle Ocho in Miami, if it's you know Puerto Rican this or whatever, you know when we're wearing our colors, doing our dances, playing our music, eating our food, you know, everybody, they cover that. They're, it's good TV, it's good visuals, it's all these kinds of elements, it's pride, it's this and that. So that gets covered. But that's a zoo. It's like going to the zoo, you look in a cage, you see a tiger. And then you go to the next cage, you see a lion. Okay, you've seen them, but you haven't seen them in their natural environment. You haven't seen them when they're not displayed. They don't cover us every day. And then the third, which is the highest may be the highest, is the problem people. We're either causing problems or beset by problems. This is the Donald Trump played on the problem people angle. Without us, our country wouldn't have all these problems. And some of them are problems that are, I mean, no one's fault. You send kids to school who don't know English because they come from Spanish-speaking homes. Okay, that's a problem for the schools. Well, that's a problem for that kid, too if the school doesn't accommodate them. So then you have this issue you have to deal with. So we're either causing them or we're beset by them. It's rare, it happens, but it's rare 
that you meet read a success story about a Latino, or I'd say, or a black athlete or a politician or celebrity, where they're not pictured at some point in their life of having to overcome some hardship that is part of being Mexican or black. They grew up in a gang neighborhood. They uh, parents in a single parent family. The, this you know whatever. It's always it's because they were Latino or black they had to deal with this hardship, and those are problem people. So those are the three major. Now again, you can do the research, and maybe you can show me that's wrong. We're getting a little bit more mainstream in terms of if there's a energy crisis. They interview people, households around, things like that, but they're not players. <coughs> you don't see us certainly on these TV talk shows, which research gets done again and again and again. We're what they call the brownout studies. We're not in there. So, yes, we have more visibility, but not near as much as we should have, and it doesn't necessarily lead to understanding of who we are, what we are. The old melting pot, you know, that you leave behind who you were to become who you're going to be, forget your language, your culture, your this and that, has never applied to us, partially because we were barred, but secondly because we didn't cross an ocean in many cases. We're, you know, we're, we're here, we're here in Los Angeles, so what, why not, why not keep some Spanish? You know, we have a different, they, they try to impose the European model on us. And it hasn't worked and shouldn't work. And going back to NAJ and CCNMA, which were the, the, the main uh, objects of this, this interview, uh, looking back, uh, what do you think have been the... And, and, and you can talk about either, both, or make a comparison, so this is kind of open to you, however you want to answer this. But what do you think have been the main achievements, and on the other hand, the unfulfilled potential or the disappointments? Well, at this stage, uh, the stage where we were trying to figure out what the relationship would be, around the time of that meeting, by the, the lunch meeting by the LA Times, one of the CCNMA members, not me, so I don't take credit for it. He said, uh, we're giving birth to what people will think is our parent. And I think that's the, that, that just sums it up. If there's the national this and the regional that, the national must be the parent of the regional or the state or the dominating group or whatever. So, I think there was greater potential than has ever been fulfilled for the two groups to work together. They've joined forces out here within the last year and a half, two years. But it was at a point where neither group was strong. I think NAHJ is in better shape now than it was then, at least from what I read in there, what they post. Um, It's hard to make a strong link, a chain out of weak links, and they didn't come in as, as equals. I don't know to what extent CCNMA exists in terms of ongoing programs and stuff, or what it exists independently of NEHJ. I know they do some things in conjunction, and I haven't been involved, so I don't want to pass judgment on them. You know, CCNMA was kept alive for a long time through the good work of Julio Moran and other executive directors who preceded him. The membership base that I had of committed people who were, I don't know, the lonely only, it passed because more people came into the newsroom. So it didn't fulfill that need anymore to get out, you know. And there was the pipeline, there were people. I mean, it was rare to meet a high school student who wanted to do journalism. Now, you, you know, you can, Latino, now you can meet them all over the the place where you do things. So they needed to, do, you know, they needed to adapt to new, the new realities. And, and they did sustain the banquets, the scholarships, the awards programs, and the job fair for a long time. And certainly the job, I mean, just take the job fair. People don't look for jobs that way anymore. You'd all get in one room at one place at one time. It's online, it's this and that. It's, you know, you filed. You, and the traditional employers 
have merged and come, you know what used to be independent newspapers are now owned by you know Digital First or Gannett or whatever McClatchy out here. So you know where you'd have maybe four recruiters come, now the recruiters are all you know under the same chain, so they'd send one person out. So the reality's changed, and you need to adapt to them. Uh, you, at a certain point, you can sustain what you've been doing. Another point, you have to change. And I think CCNMA uh, sustained what it had, uh, but is, was less successful in changing to what it had been. NEHJ had a very active period when Juan Gonzalez, who was a founder, now a professor so he's at, at Rutgers, so he's made the change too, was president. And at, one, and at one point, I was when he was president, I was doing more stuff with NEHJ than with uh, CCNMA. And I told him, I said, what? I never thought the day would come when I'd be doing more with, for you know, activities with NEHJ than CCNMA. So he had a spike period. Um, then they ran into some hard times later on. It appears that they're coming out of them, around them. You can talk to them to find out. Um, my concern there is, well, they've made good moves in terms of student membership campus chapters, faculty, these kinds of things. Um, <coughs> I would hope that they would have played a much more active and visible role in, I don't want to say confronting Trump, because again, once you confront somebody you're not, as an organization, you might not be able to cover them. But raising the issues, you know, that should have been addressed with correct information and such, and getting the attention that they should have. I mean, this thing with Jorge Ramos being, you know, go back to Univision. I grew up with people yelling that you go back to Mexico. Even though, you know, my family's been here since this was Mexico. This real estate, not this piece of land, but in this valley. Since it was, so we didn't, you know, we didn't. Mexico was taken from us. We didn't leave Mexico. Uh, but that, that kind of thing was, you know, uncalled for. He ran, his initial statement was taken on. They don't send us their best. I mean, how many of us, you know, my my grandparents and my, my mother, they came up from Mexico, and my grandfather was a minister. He wasn't a drug dealer. He wasn't a... So most people come up here to work and, and do do the work. So I think they could have been more uh, assertive in correcting the record in a factual way, which is the way a journal, that's the role journalists play. Whether it would have changed anything, I don't know. Uh, I think the other thing is that the NHJ has done a good job over the years, and particularly more recently, in working with the Spanish language media. But they could have done more earlier, beyond Rafael Prieto's efforts and such. Because uh, that's where the growth is, that's been the growth sector within our, within our media. Now, what do you say, good or bad? Or, I mean, I'm glad we have, we've had, I'm glad we have had, and we still have both organizations. And they played a role at a very critical time, uh, particularly as the things got going when this was, race in this country was even more then than it is now a black and white issue. We were helped by a lot of black people and by a lot of white people who believed in what we wanted to do or needed to do, and gave us the space and time to show. It was kind of like, I felt like they say, we we heard you sing, now let's see if you can dance. So yeah, you, you're yelling about this stuff, you're doing it, you know, fine, okay. You know, like the guy said, if I come out to California, will you have Chicanos I can talk to? Fine, you know. You know, we heard, I got your message, now what can you deliver? And we had people that would give us this, this space. I had many lonely 
presentations where I was shaking, my legs were trembling behind the podium, speaking to editors. Not because they were mean or anything, but that was just, you know, I was the only non-white person in the room. Or sometimes I was the only non-white person besides the black person who was also going to talk, Bob Maynard or Jay Harris or Nancy Maynard or somebody like that. And telling them, you know, we can do it, we have to do it, you know. It's, and then, and that. so, uh, but if I had that venue because some white person invited me. Some white person set it up, some white guy. Did it so I think we had we had an opportunities that we either made or found and then we or were presented to us and then we had to deliver and those those are not the same it's not the same environment now I mean you turn on the Cecilia Vega was anchoring the the news you have the weekend anchors now are Latinos in a couple of the networks. You know we didn't have any of that. So, in in from your insight, from your career and, and your involvement in in the organizations and in the Freedom Forum, uh, what now that every, now that things have changed, things are different. The business is different. Uh, what can be done now to improve what what's left to you know, the, all the pending work? Well, I think the first thing you should do is get away from the head counting. This has become a number, you know, how many are you employed and all that. And that's a factor and that's a force and all that. But the reason you want the presence is to influence the content. You know, what are they talking about? Fine, it's you can have a white, I mean, a Latino asking questions of somebody on Meet the Press, if they ever do. <laughs> Give it all. But what questions are being asked? What are being, are being addressed? I mean, that's that was the thing with Jorge Ramos. You know, he wasn't just there standing up asking him, what's your next campaign uh, stop? He was pressing an issue. And by pressing an issue, you're raising the issue. Because if you weren't there, that issue that cut, you know, would not have been put on the table. I wouldn't have to think about it. So I think we should put more emphasis on content, that uh, every Latino journalist is a potential Ruben Salazar, but so is every lat journalist of every other race, white, black, Asian. You know, we need, to, we need to be recognized as a force within this country that is one of several forces that have not been well attended to by the media in the past, and that gets beyond numbers. Just filling a slot in a way that an Anglo could have done the job is not progress as at this era in the way it was in the previous era. And everybody has a responsibility to reflect all of the society that it is. Now, whether you can quantify that, whether you can measure that, where you can put a number on it, which is what corporations like to do, I don't know. I think it's harder to do that, but I think that's what they, because that's how you get to the understanding of the minor, the people nobody knows. People will know us if they understand it, not just if they see us. So if I, if I, I, I don't know if this comparison works, but it would be, uh, instead of focusing on the number of people, like you said, on head counts, focusing on, on, on how it's done, on, on the actual practice, on what, how the issues are portrayed. Yeah, what is being done. I'm not saying it should be, uh, let me make sure I'm clear, I might not have been. I don't say you should stop counting. I don't, that shouldn't be the end game, is what I'm saying. Okay. The end game should be, which is what the Kerner Commission said 49 years ago, should be on the substance of the news report. What is being reported? How is it being reported? You know, uh, not just the role modeling of who's reporting it. That's important. More important is what are people taking away from this? And we're not there yet. I mean, you still see these issues. I've seen them, special reports on race. It's all black and white by major news organizations. I mean, I picked one up, I forget what, in Washington Post. And it was a, and it was a mag, it was a special issue there. I said, oh, it's about race, man. I'm gonna, it was all black. 
I said, well, what about the Asians? What about, you know, how come we're not in this thing? So there's still that uh, thing, you know, that we're part of the game. Then we, we had a lot of black people. You know, I learned like Nancy Maynard and Lee Barrow at the Journalism Education and Jay Harris. And I mean, I had African Americans show me the way. They had just gotten, <coughs> in the 70s, they had just gotten their foot in the door. They had just found out there was a meeting. I mean, they found out there was a minorities committee of the American Society of Newspaper Editors. They didn't even know there was. They found out there was, so they got in at the meeting. And then they kept their foot in the door and said, you know, hey, you, you get in here too. So they broke some of the ground for us, but they didn't want to get in and just close the door. And I don't think we should do this. We should be open to all advocacy, women, sexual orientation. It's all about getting a complete picture. That's a, that's a great, great that's way it. To, to close. Uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that you think it's uh, good to bring up? Anything you want to comment on? Well, I think there's a role for journalism educators as educators in and of themselves. As I look back at my short career, I, um, a lot of what I did was attached to somebody else doing something. CCNMA doing something. Getting editors to do something. Getting students prepared so they could do something. And that's good, and that's part of what you do as a professor. But also part of what you do is your own, your own research, your own contributions. When you have a PhD, just the fact that you have that and you might have a professor in front of that it gives you some credibility that people assume that it's not something for you to ride on, but it's something to build on. So um, I think a lot of my career could have been, well, I could have focused on studying Latinos in journalism working for Anglo organizations. That was a new phenomenon in the 70s. But I said, well, I mean, I grew up listening to Spanish language for hearing it around the house. So I did my dissertation on Spanish language radio. Nobody had ever done that before. I did an uh, early research on what is now Univision, formerly Spanish International, and how the Ascaraga family had basically circumvented American law, which is now they're changing the law. Now. But they had they had seventy five more than seventy five percent control of a TV network in the United States, totally illegal. Later they they got challenged and they had to give it up. What have Spanish language newspapers been doing? Some of the work I did at Texas 40 years ago in Austin when the library was still in that tower uh, was looking at old Spanish language. So I think professors need to define a unique role that they can do, a role they can play. It doesn't have to be what I, what I did, uh, and it's good that more people are doing it. But there's a role you play as a faculty member that is beyond teaching, and as a journalism faculty member, that's beyond uh, getting people to hire folks or fill internships or things like this, that uh, you have a base. Very few professions have the, the luxury of tenure or academic freedom, or in the case of faculty, the fact that they can't make you retire, at least now, based on age alone. So you have that base, and, and you will have that base shortly. Um, that I think we need to, to look at that. We end up being absorbed by the institution. The institution, the degree and institutional affiliation that many people think would liberate us, because it gives you that freedom that, I mean, you earn it. It's not that they don't give it to you. You know, you got it's hard earned, but once you have it, it liberates. But often ends up capturing you, because you become so ingrained into, you know, meeting their demands, uh, that you don't. Uh, you don't exercise. You don't take full advantage, of, or you don't always take full advantage, of the independence you have. So I'd like to see an organization of Latino journalism, communication, media, whatever you call it, faculty members 
that is not based on networking, on uh, you know credentialing publication. I mean, fine, you can do that, but the basis is, to, and maybe it could be happening. And I'm retired now, so I've been part of it. Uh, but that's basically looking at you know what can we bring to the table? What understanding do we have? What experiences do we have that we can bring to the table that add to others? Because in reality, I'm going beyond the academic. Latinos and other marginalized groups are the model for the future, and the present and the future. We live in a multicultural, multilingual, multinational, multi-identity, you know, society now. So who is better prepared than people who have always lived in the world of two languages, more than one culture, on and on, you know. And I'm not just talking about Latin Asians and others, you know, gays and lesbians how to live in a straight world and live in a an LGBT world. So, I mean, the model is people who had more than one identity and negotiated them successfully. Not always happily, but successfully. So that would be my, uh, if I was jumping into it now. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much.